मॉर्निंग एवरीवन प्लीज सुचन वेब कैम्प्स एम ऑडिबल ऑल ऑफ यू ओके थैंक यू सो मच इज माई वॉइस क्लियर ओके All of you, please switch on the webcams so that I can see you. All of you are able to see the screen. Yes. Okay. So, welcome to the analysis of the Economic Survey 22-23. Now, before I start with the analysis of Economic Survey. Uh, let me tell you we are extremely sorry for the delay in carrying out the analysis sorry for the inconvenience i know you have been waiting since long for the analysis of the economic survey but uh, due to certain unavoidable circumstances we were not able to conduct the economic survey on time but you need not worry from now onwards because this week as well as next week in these two weeks will be done with the complete analysis of the economic survey apart from that some aspects of budget was also pending especially the aspects related to the important taxation proposals in the union budget so even those taxation proposals also i shall be uh, carrying out an analysis in these classes so you would have the economic survey class today as well as next week so by the end of next week we'll be done with the analysis you need not worry about it and after that you'll have sufficient amount of time to prepare for this as well you need not worry about it okay so let's start with the analysis of the economic survey but before i start with the analysis let us briefly discuss as to what exactly is economic survey and what does this year's economic survey talks about uh, basically so let's look into these aspects one by one so you all must be knowing that the economic survey is prepared by the chief economic advisor who is functioning under the ministry of finance right now the chief economic advisor is mr anant nageshwaran and this economic survey is usually presented one day before the presentation of the budget so we all know that the budget is usually presented on 1st of february every year so one day before the presentation of the budget the economic survey is presented now when you come to this year's economic survey this year's economic survey is quite important because as you know in the year 2022 india celebrated 75 years of its independence and in the year 2047 we are going to celebrate 100 years of india's independence so as india moves from india at 75 to india at 100 this particular phase as you know the government has coined it as amrit kal so this year's economic survey is important because in a way this economic survey is going to lay down a blueprint for the things to come in the next 25 years that is why it is important now before i start with the analysis uh, let me briefly touch upon the different chapters which are included in this year's economic survey and what do each of these chapters basically tell us about the indian economy briefly we'll look into these things one by one when you look at the first chapter of economic survey it is titled as state of economy 22 23 recovery complete as the name suggests this particular chapter gives us a birds eye view of the entire indian economy in terms of my nominal gdp the real gdp trends in the contribution of different drivers of india's economy the trends in the contribution of different sectors and all of those things apart from that this particular chapter is equally important for the mains examination also because this chapter discusses as to what challenges did indian economy face in the year 22 23 what was the response of the government to tackle these challenges and what is the present state of indian economy 
and more importantly what challenges we might face in future so this is what this particular chapter talks about when you look at the second chapter the second chapter says india's medium term growth outlook with optimism and hope now when you look at this chapter this chapter basically highlights the achievements of the government in the last 10 years so as you know the nda government came into power in the year 2014 and elections are going to be conducted in the next year so this chapter in a way highlights what all reforms has the government taken and how these reforms have borne fruits for the indian economy so this is that particular chapter next is fiscal developments revenue relish now when you look at this chapter this chapter highlights that in the year 2020 2021 the indian economy was affected by covid-19 pandemic because of which the total tax collection of the government reduced while its expenditure increased so this led to increase in fiscal deficit while on the other hand in the financial year 22 23 because there was increase in my nominal gdp growth rate the overall tax collections of the government has increased in particularly it highlights a very important concept that the tax buoyancy with respect to gst is more than 1 which means every 1% increase in the nominal gdp growth rate has led to more than 1% increase in gst tax collections which is a new development and hence it is important the next one is monetary management and financial intermediation and look at the word a good year why it is a good year this is because this year's economic survey has highlighted that the nps of the banks have got reduced to 5% which is lowest in the last 5 years so we all know that the indian economy was so far facing the problem of twin balance sheet because the nps of the banks had got increased but fortunately the nps of the banks has now reduced to 5% which is lowest which is very good development as far as indian economy is concerned apart from that with respect to financial intermediation it highlights another important development which has taken place now we all know that since the us fed bank has adopted fed tapering there was large scale fpi outflow from the indian economy but this chapter highlights that in spite of large scale fpi outflow indian economy as such did not get much affected this is because of the fact that the net outflow of fpi was compensated by increase in the domestic investment in the capital market so we all know that in the last 2 years large number of indians have opened demat accounts and they are you uh, know making a lot of investment in share market so in a way the large outflow of fpi was cushioned by the inflow of domestic investment so which is a good thing next one is prices and inflation successful tight rope walking now look at this word it says tight rope walking can you guess what is the tight rope which this economic survey is talking about it's basically the dilemma which the rbi faced in the year 22 23 with respect to controlling inflation vis-a-vis need to promote growth so on one hand indian economy is facing inflation inflation was more than 6% for 9 consecutive months whereas the gdp was also slowing down if rbi had focus on controlling inflation rbi had to increase the policy rates but if increase policy rates means increase in rate of interest on loans the gdp growth rate would have got compromised so this was a very tight rope walking for the rbi and how rbi has managed this dilemma this is what this chapter talks about next is social infrastructure and employment big tent once again when you look at this particular chapter <coughs> usually this chapter is placed at the end of the economic survey in the other years but this year this particular chapter has been placed much above which goes on to signify the amount of importance which the government is giving for inclusive growth and development so this particular chapter has a lot of schemes programs initiatives which the government has taken to promote inclusive growth and development and altogether this becomes important because in mains gs paper 3 you have the topic of inclusive growth 
and in prelims also we might get questions related to government schemes programs and initiatives climate change and environment this is another important chapter in the context of india's ambitious target to achieve net carbon zero emissions as well as ndcs nationally determined contributions then the other chapters are agriculture and food management from food security to nutritional security look at the word food security to nutritional security which goes on to show that indian agriculture has made rapid strides as far as food grain production is concerned the food grain production has increased to 315 million tons but the problem with the indian agriculture is lack of diversification so we have not given due amount of emphasis on producing pulses oil seeds fruits and vegetables and so on which in turn is affecting our nutritional security so that is why this topic talks about nutritional security next chapter is about industry steady recovery services which is our source of strength because service sector accounts for more than 50% of india's gdp next one is external sector and look at this watchful and hopeful so the indian economy was critically uh, it faced challenges because of external shocks right so this chapter is about that particular external sector and last chapter but it's not the least this chapter is about the physical and digital infrastructure now we all know that the government has taken a number of initiatives to promote infrastructure initiatives such as national infrastructure pipeline national monetization pipeline gati shakti and so on so this particular chapter discusses in detail about the physical as well as digital infrastructure and we know that this particular chapter physical and digital infrastructure becomes extremely extremely important from the perspective of the gs paper 3 mains there we have a separate topic of infrastructure so these are some of the chapters that we will be discussing in the economic survey this year <clears throat> now coming to what is the overall importance of the economic survey as far as prelims examination is concerned let's look into the importance so we all know last year we had almost 18 questions in the upsc prelims from the indian economy out of those 18 questions like 3 to 4 questions could have been easily answered by going through the economic survey of last year let me give you certain examples to substantiate my point you can see this was a question asked in prelims 2022 in particular focus on the statement which i have highlighted the statement reads dated securities issued at market rated rates in auctions form a large component of internal debt this was a statement asked and look at the economic survey analysis part 1 which i had conducted last year last year i had highlighted that the overall internal debt of india has increased to 49.5% of india's gdp and out of this internal debt i had clearly highlighted that the dated securities account for the largest component and the same thing was there in prelims 2022 as well second concentrate on these two questions asked in prelims 2022 in these two questions the statement here as well as statement here basically requires you to understand what is the impact of the us fed bank policies on the indian economy and what actions is the rbi likely to take in order to counter any negative effects this is what you must know and you can see in the last year's economic survey analysis part 2 i discuss the types of fed uh, policies pursued by us fed bank that is quantitative easing and fed tapering and what is its impact on the indian economy and what steps should the rbi take so that is the overall importance of the economic survey so as far as economic survey is concerned there are two ways you can expect the questions either you can get direct questions from the economic survey that is one thing or you could get questions which are applied so when you go to the economic survey your understanding of indian economy will increase and based upon that understanding you will be able to solve the questions in the upsc prelims examination
ओके आई होप ये क्लियर ओके इज अ स्लाइड क्लियरली विजिबल इट्स नॉट पॉसिबल टू शेयर द स्क्रीन बिकॉज वी आर ऑल्सो गोइंग लाइव ऑन द यूट्यूब दैट्स अ रीजन द स्लाइड इज नॉट शेयर बट आई होप इट इज विजिबल कमल प्रीत आर यू फेसिंग ए डिफिकल्टी यू आर एबल टू सी इट क्लियरली राइट ओके ओके सो लेट स्टार्ट विद द फर्स्ट चैप्टर ऑफ द इकोनॉमिक सर्वे दैट इज द स्टेट ऑफ इंडियन इकोनॉमी now let me discuss as to what all things we are going to discuss in this particular chapter first and foremost we'll understand the overview of indian economy so as part of this overview we'll understand what challenges that indian economy face in the year 22 23 what was the response of the government to counter these challenges what is the present status and what are the future challenges that we might face now this particular chapter of economic survey let me tell you it is filled with a lot of facts a lot of figures a lot of analysis which as such are not really important from the perspective of the upsc mains examination from this particular chapter what i think is you can expect a question in the mains examination so the question that we can expect in the mains examination is this you can read the question it says discuss as to how the global external shocks have affected the indian economy in 22 23 do you think indian economy has the resilience to withstand these shocks this is the kind of question that you can expect so we'll discuss the answer to this question need not worry second part we we'll look at the trends in important macro economic indicators which are important from the perspective of the prelims examination and the third part we will discuss some important terms which have been used in the chapter 1 of the economic survey for example there is a term called as dollar index so we'll understand what is dollar index the concept of core debt or non financial sector debt have you come across this word non financial debt any times non financial debt anyone yeah good madhusudan it was asked in the prelims examination of prelims 2020 so there was a direct question as to what is the non financial debt baltic dry index this is once again a topic which has been introduced in this year's economic survey so we'll understand these things one by one so this is what we are going to discuss so let's start with the overview of the indian economy so when i'm going to discuss the overview of indian economy i'm going to discuss this purely from the perspective of the upsc mains examination so based upon my discussion you should be in a position to write an answer to this particular practice question right so let's try to understand as to uh, what is the overview which the chapter 1 of the economic survey talks about okay concentrate here the overview of indian economy let's start with the challenges that indian economy faced in the year 22 23 we all know that indian economy has been affected by global external shocks in the past for example it was affected by the gulf crisis in 1990s which eventually led to the bop crisis in 1991 it was also affected by the global financial crisis of 2007 8 but the good thing about the previous global external shocks was these external shocks did not take place immediately one after another there was significant gap between these external shocks because there was a significant gap the indian economy got enough time to recoup or to recover from these external shocks but like i said in the economics uh, budget discussion before this last 3 to 4 years have not been very good for the indian economy from the perspective of external shocks because indian economy was affected by triple external shocks one after another and it did not give sufficient time for the indian economy to recover from one external shock the first external shock like i said it all started with the covid-19 pandemic which ultimately led to the external structural shock in terms of slowdown in my gdp growth rate and as the indian economy was recovering from covid-19 pandemic we all have known that indian economy was showing a v-shaped economic recovery 
so as it was showing a v shape economic recovery it got affected by the synchronized rate hikes by global central banks so we all know that during covid 19 pandemic the global central banks pumped in huge amount of money into their economies subsequently when lockdown was lifted the money supply in their economies was very high so rate of inflation in the advanced economies increased to very high level like the rate of inflation in us is at four decade high same can be said about europe so in response to the rising inflation the global central banks started increasing the policy rates we discussed in the last year's economic survey that us fed bank has adopted fed tapering right next is supply side shock due to russia ukraine war so because of russia ukraine war there was supply chain disruptions which led to increase in international crude oil prices increase in food prices fertilizer prices and so on and these shocks it so happened that one shock was immediately preceded uh, followed by another shock that is what the problem so this in turn had a impact on indian economy we discuss what is the impact we call this impact as what taper tantrum what is this taper tantrum so we have seen that because there was a rate hike by us fed bank there was large scale fpi outflow similarly because of supply chain disruption there was increase in my cost of imports that is crude oil food fertilizer these two reasons together led to a large scale rupee depreciation in fact it is being said that between april to december 2022 the rupee value depreciated by almost 8.8% so there was large scale rupee depreciation and we know that as the rupee depreciates what happens to my imports imports into india become costly as imports become costly it led to increase in my current account deficit apart from that as the rupee value was depreciating RBI had to intervene to check the rupee depreciation, and we know what RBI does to check rupee depreciation from the forex reserves. It will inject dollars. So this repeated intervention by the RBI to check rupee depreciation has led to decline in my forex reserves. For example, forex reserves has reduced from six hundred fifty billion dollars to five hundred sixty billion dollars. so you can see the overall fall in my forex reserves it is almost by 90 billion dollars similarly as there was large scale fpi outflow these fpis they were selling the government securities in india because they were selling government securities supply of government securities increased as the supply increased what do you think has happened to bond prices supply increases means bond prices will fall as the bond prices fall bond price and bond yields they are inversely proportional so bond yields increased so there was increase in bond yields and we know that if bond yields increase what happens to borrowing cost of the government borrowing cost of the government will increase the government will be required to borrow at a higher rate of interest and we also face a high rate of inflation because of imported inflation and we know that the rate of inflation has remained above 6% for three consecutive quarters so rbi for the first time has not been able to keep inflation within its target so these are the shocks and this is the impact so go back to the question here look at the question discuss as to how global external shocks have affected indian economy in the year 22 23 so here you need to talk about what are the three triple shocks that we faced and then after talking about the triple shocks you have to talk about how it affected the indian economy so basically here with respect to effect you should focus upon taper tantrums so you need to use these kinds of technical words in the mains examination so someone was asking me as to explain the topic about uh, bond yields what i would suggest to them is to know about the relationship between bond price and bond yields please go back and watch my previous year's economic survey in which i have discussed in detail the relationship between bond price and bond yields you must understand that the time that we have to cover economic survey is quite limited so i can't go into the specifics of these points nevertheless if you want to know about it i have already discussed this in the previous year budget please go through that point are we clear i sure i hope it's clear 
ओके थैंक यू ओके ना लेट्स टॉक अबाउट इंडिया रिजिलियंस टू एक्सटर्नल शॉक्स सो लुक एट दिस क्वेश्चन Do you think Indian economy has been resilient to external shocks? So we have to talk about whether India was able to withstand these shocks, and if India was able to withstand these shocks, why it was able to withstand these shocks? That is what you have to talk about. So look at this. India was been able to resilient to or India has been resilient to external shocks because our forex reserves is five hundred sixty billion dollars, and India has the world's fourth largest forex reserves. So look at nineteen ninety one. In the year 1991, we faced BOP crisis because the amount of forex reserves that we had then was very less. But now we have adequate forex reserves. That is why it did not affect us much. Similarly, import cover of Indian economy is eight months, which means for next eight months we can actually continue to pay for our imports by using our forex reserves. So, which is good enough. And look at our external debt to GDP ratio. It is like 20 percent. Which is quite low when it compared to the other countries. In particular, we know that there are some neighboring countries of India which faced soaring debt crisis last year. So it's like saying about Sri Lanka faced the external debt crisis. In case of Sri Lanka, the external debt to GDP ratio was almost around sixty-five percent, and our external debt to GDP ratio is just twenty percent. So we did not worry about it. and look at the next point strong economic recovery of gdp growth rate of 7% so here with respect to my gdp growth rate for the financial year 22 23 it has shown a strong recovery and the real gdp growth rate is expected to be at 7% which clearly goes on to show that in spite of these negative effects on the indian economy india was still able to register a good gdp growth rate so india can i say was been resilient to these shocks right but if you just mention that india has been resilient to external shocks that alone is not sufficient you have to highlight as to why was india resilient to these external shocks what steps we have taken look at the steps that we have taken we know that the government has increased the capital expenditure to 3.3% of gdp which we have discussed in the budget because of increase in capital expenditure by the government we have been able to crowd in private sector investment we have been able to release the pent up demand pent up demand means when the country was in lockdown uh, there was poor consumer sentiment there was uncertainty among the people with respect to their future jobs future rise in income level so people curtailed their spending but now when things are looking very certain people have started buying more goods and services which has in turn released the pent up demand and we know that this release of pent up demand can be seen with respect to increase in the consumption expenditure of indian economy rbi has taken proactive measures to control rupee depreciation there is decrease in nps of banks to 5% like i said so the balance sheet of the banks has improved and last and most importantly like i said the tax buoyancy of gst has increased to 1.1% 1.1 which is good thing so because of these reasons india has shown a strong resilience to external shocks but it being said that we cannot say that indian economy is completely insulated from these external shocks we are might face still some problems in future what problems we can face in future for example the rate of inflation in the advanced economies is still very high because of which the global central banks might decide to continue continue to increase the interest rate this can have the effect which is these effects in terms of taper tantrum so we are not still insulated from taper tantrum it might increase in future higher level of public debt so we know that uh, with respect to public debt the government has borrowed huge amount of money to uh, uh, to finance the covid-19 pandemic so the overall public debt of center as well as state together has increased to 85% so 60% is a debt of the center and 25% debt is of the state government in future there might be fall in the pent up demand and last and most is there are hints that the global economy might fall in might fall into recession and if that happens what is going to happen to india's exports there could be fall in our exports so these are our challenges 
someone is asking me to explain about uh, tax buoyancy need not worry that's a topic which we will be discussing uh, later as of now you just understand tax buoyancy means 1% increase in gdp that is nominal gdp leads to how much percent increase in my tax collection that is what is tax buoyancy need not worry about it okay just give me one minute Okay, so by now, I hope you will be able to write answer to, to this question, right? Okay, so let's uh, take up this part, trends in macroeconomic indicators. So let's first look at the kind of questions which we have been asked in the previous year prelims with respect to GDP and other important aspects. Prelims 2022, there was a question about real sector in the economy. So this question is conceptual. And uh, any guess what's the answer to this question? You can respond in the chat box. Good Chandrakant. If you are responding, please respond it directly to me, not to everyone because it will disturb everyone. Good. So right answer is A, 1 and 2. And look at this question asked in prelims 2019. When you look at this question asked in prelims 2019, there are two things which UPSC tested. One, whether the students know what is purchasing power parity which is conceptual and second thing is factual that is what is india's ranking with respect to purchasing power parity as you know india's ranking in terms of purchasing power parity kitna hai? india's plays at third place in terms of ppp so right answer in this case is one only next question asked in prelims 2017 this question is with respect to contribution of different sectors their trends basically so what is the trends in the contribution of agriculture and those things has been asked in the prelims 2017. In prelims 2015, there was a question with respect to trends in the GDP growth rate. So based upon this particular analysis of the previous year questions, we can come to conclusion that either you could get questions which are conceptual and related to GDP. That is one type. The second type of question is with respect to trends in important macroeconomic indicators. Now, with respect to one conceptual thing related to GDP, which could be asked in the upcoming prelims, is with respect to difference between GDP and GVA. Some of you must have heard about GDP and GVA, right? So, there is a divergence between GDP and GVA, and that could be asked in the upcoming prelims examination. Need not worry about it. I will be discussing it in this class later on. Okay? And we could be asked questions with respect to trends in the important macroeconomic indicators. So let's look at trends in my real and nominal GDP in terms of absolute value in lakh crores. And look at my nominal GDP. My nominal GDP in terms of absolute size is 270 lakh crores nominal GDP and my real GDP is 157 lakh crores in the year 22-23 and concentrate on my nominal GDP and real GDP in the year 2020-21 when Indian economy was affected by COVID-19. So can you see that there was a fall in my real GDP? There was a fall in my nominal GDP because of COVID-19 pandemic but now we can see that nominal GDP has increased and even the real GDP has increased. So that is why, what is the first chapter of economic survey says? First chapter of economic survey says, strong recovery, strong rebound. Now I hope you are getting to know what is the first chapter talking about, that we have fully recovered from the COVID-19 pandemic because there has been a large scale increase in my nominal GDP as well as real GDP. Look at the trends in the real and nominal GDP growth rates, trends. So here, look at the nominal GDP growth rate. It has been quite exceptional for us. The nominal GDP growth rate has been 15%, whereas the real GDP growth rate has been 
which is very good on the other hand look what happened to my nominal gdp growth rate and real gdp growth rate in the covid year there was a fall in both my real gdp growth rate real gdp growth rate reduced to minus 7.2 and nominal gdp growth rate reduced to minus 3% so once again we have started growing at the level which used to grow before the covid-19 pandemic which is another good development as far as our economy is concerned are we clear with this okay so let's take up some questions okay let's look at this question practice question number 1 consider the following statements the gva is usually higher than gdp increase in net indirect taxes reduces the divergence between gdp and gva so let's look at the explanation to this let's understand what is the gdp and gva okay i can see some of you are already responding good but it's for benefit of those students who are attending the class because they don't know what's the difference between gdp and gva so let's understand these things first and then we'll come back and solve the question focus here when i want to measure gdp i can measure gdp at factor cost i can measure gdp at basic price and i can measure gdp at market price gdp at factor cost basically tells us how much is the factor of production to produce goods and services cost of factors of production so here we will take into account factors of production that is land labor capital and so on when you say basic price basic price here tells us how much price is the manufacturer expected to receive when he sells the goods and services in the market so here basic price is a price which the manufacturer is expected to receive market price is measuring gdp from the perspective of a consumer how much price is a consumer expected to pay on purchase of goods and services so to simplify this let me consider the manufacturing of this marker theek okay? hai to manufacture this marker let's say i am a manufacturer i am using different factors of production that is land labor capital and so on and let's say i am spending rupees 10 to produce this marker so my gdp at factor cost will be equal to rupees 10 when i am going to sell this marker how much price am i expected to receive that is the basic price and here this basic price is calculated as the factor cost plus production taxes minus production subsidies what is production taxes production taxes are the taxes which the manufacturers pay on factors of production so when uh, manufacturers pay taxes on land which is stamp duty it becomes a production tax similarly the manufacturers might also get subsidy from the government subsidy from the government could be in the form of free land free electricity so that becomes my factor cost uh, sorry the basic price and let's see here this basic price could be for example equal to rupees 12 consumer when you are producing uh, buying these goods right so how will you calculate this one it is basic price plus product taxes minus product subsidies so you are a consumer you are paying certain taxes on buying of products it is different from production taxes because production taxes paid by whom manufacturer but product taxes who is paying the consumer so what product tax you to pay you pay gst similarly you as a consumer you are also getting substance subsidy from the government on the products that you buy like you get food subsidy you get lpg subsidy and so on so to my basic price if i add the product taxes and deduct the product subsidies i'll get the market price and this market price could be like rupees 15 so look at the different levels of gdp 
10 is my factor cost, 12 is my basic price, 15 is my market price, right? Now, what is important is this GDP that I measure at basic price, it is also called as GVA, gross value addition. So, keeping this in mind, let's try to understand as to why there could be a difference between GVA and GDP. When I say GVA, it is basic price. And when I say GDP, it is the market price. So let's understand the difference between the two. So you can see, concentrate here on the board. GDP at market price, as we discussed, it is equal to GVA at basic price plus product taxes minus product subsidies, which we call it as net indirect taxes. When you look at the word net indirect taxes, can I say that the taxes that we pay on products, it is usually higher than the subsidies that we get on products. Always we pay more taxes and we get less subsidies, which means that the net indirect taxes as far as India is concerned, it is always positive. It is always positive. So, look at the formula. GDP at market price is equal to GVA at basic price plus a positive value, which means which is always higher in India. In India, the GDP at market price is higher than GVA at basic price. This is higher because the net indirect taxes is positive. But if I want to find out how much is GDP at market price higher than GVA at basic price, this how much higher will in turn depend upon the value of this net indirect taxes. If net indirect taxes value increase, it means to the GVA at basic price, you are adding a positive value which is higher. So, GDP at market price and GVA at basic price, the divergence will increase. On the other hand, if this net indirect taxes reduce, it is still positive, but it is reducing which means GVA at basic price plus a positive value which has got reduced. So, difference between GDP at market price and GVA at basic price will reduce. Divergence will reduce. Now, for example, you can see first scenario, COVID-19. In COVID-19, we collected less product taxes. This is quite simple because uh, the government, uh, because there was decline in GDP, people spent less money to purchase goods and services. So, there was decline in product taxes, but increase in product subsidies. Government had to give more subsidies to the people, such as the food subsidy, LP subsidy and so on. So, there was decline in the positive value of net indirect taxes, because of which GDP, difference between GDP and GVA reduce ho gaya. Are we clear, all of you? Look at the second scenario 2, which is the present case. In the present case, there is increase in my nominal GDP. Normal GDP has increased means people are purchasing more goods and services. GST collections of the government has increased. So, there is increase in product taxes. Similarly, as the GDP has increased and since the ba things have ba come back to normal, the need for the government to give more subsidies to people has reduced. So, there is decrease in product subsidies because of which there is increase in the positive value of net indirect taxes and hence difference between GDP and GV has increased. You are getting this point? Now what is happening? We are seeing a greater divergence and that is in news and that is why you can expect a question related to this aspect. So let us go back to this question, quickly tell me the answer and please keep your cameras on so that I can see you, all of you. Good, good Muskan, good Ashwin. Good Divek, good Deepak, good Surbi, good Palash, good Jyoti. Yes. So, right answer in this case is neither one nor two. Good. Look at this question. What do you think if I had to guess the answer? Good Chandrakant, good Alia, good Muskan, good Ritubaran, good. Okay. First statement says recession is defined as contraction in GDP for four consecutive quarters. Is it four or two? It is actually two consecutive quarters. So, for two consecutive quarters, if there is contraction in my GDP, then only it is called as recession. 
India faced recession for the first time since 1947 in 2020-2021. Is it first time? No. It is actually the fifth time. India has faced recession for the fifth time. The last time we faced recession was way back in the year 1979-1980. So right answer in this case is neither one not. Clear? Okay. Look at the percentage contribution of major drivers of Indian economy. Percentage contribution. You can see that whenever we measure GDP by expenditure method, we take into account PFC, private final consumption expenditure, government final consumption expenditure, gross capital formation, which includes gross fixed capital formation, changes in stocks, as well as valuables. And we take into account net exports, which is calculated as total exports minus imports. That is how we calculate my net exports. And you can see out of these, which is a major contributing factor to India's economy. PFCE, private final consumption expenditure, which means people are now spending more on goods and services. So, which clearly shows that this is a major driving force and there is pickup in my consumption expenditure. Next, if you see in the year 2020 2021, there was decline in my GDP growth rate because of the economic slowdown. So, that time the government has increase its expenditure particularly in creation of assets that is why this value was higher during that time and look at the gross fixed capital formation it has increased which shows the effect of crowding in effect so as the government has spent more money it has crowded in the private sector investment and look at the net value of exports net value of exports is net exports is calculated as exports minus imports and can you see my total exports minus imports hai? 22 minus 29 it is minus 7 now but look at my trade to GDP ratio now this is one important aspect which you should focus upon trade to GDP ratio is actually calculated as total value of my exports plus total value of my imports expressed as percentage of GDP how is it different from net exports? Net exports is exports minus imports. Trade to GDP is exports plus imports. Difference kya yaan pe? Minus hai, yaan pe plus hai. And look at the trade to GDP ratio of India. How much do you think it is right now? Calculate quickly. Kitna aara hai? Someone has already taken a calculator to calculate this. Good Ashwin. So what can you think of this trade to GDP ratio of India? Can you see it has increased to more than 50% of GDP? Right? So trade to GDP ratio has increased to more than 50%. This is half. Half of our GDP is through the exports and imports. Are we clear? And as far as China is concerned, we know China is one of the largest exporter of goods. Yet, it's Trade to GDP ratio, if you see the total value of exports plus total value of imports from China, it is around 37 to 38% for China. For India, the trade to GDP ratio is more than 50%. So, good thing as uh, here what you must know is India's trade to GDP ratio is much higher than that of China. Okay, please look at this practice question. If you have to guess the answer, what would you guess the answer? Consider the following statements related to private final consumption expenditure. PFC. Good luck, na? Good, Tanay. Muskan, you need to check your answer. Shailaja, Chandrakant. Okay. Focus here. Private final consumption expenditure. Let's try to understand what is it. You can see private final consumption expenditure. It's a total expenditure incurred by households plus non-profit institutions that is NGOs. So both we are taking into account to calculate private final consumption expenditure 
which is correct this statement is correct second with respect to goods see when households are spending on goods they can spend on two types of goods one is marketable goods and other one is non marketable goods marketable goods basically means these are the goods which the household is purchasing by paying money non marketable goods means these are the goods which the households are producing for their self consumption now for example let's say i'm a farmer and in one particular year i have cultivated 100 kg of rice out of this 100 kg of rice i might be selling this 80 kg of rice in the market so it is a marketable good so this marketable good will be included in my gdp calculation but remaining 20 kg of rice i am not selling it in the market i am consuming it for myself so when i calculate gdp i take into account both marketable goods as well as non marketable goods getting this point so even those goods which are produced for self consumption also are accounted can you give me one or two examples of certain uh, non marketable goods apart from the example which i gave you quickly think of it anyone if you are growing vegetables in our backyard if you are growing vegetables in a backyard that vegetables you're not going to sell it in the market but yet we are still including it by gdp look at services services are also two types marketable services and non marketable services marketable services means i am paying money to get this service non marketable means unpaid service for example i am i hire a domestic cook to prepare my food i am hiring someone to prepare my food it becomes a marketable service but let's say i don't hire a domestic cook i prepare my food by myself in case this becomes a unpaid service to me so here marketable services included but non marketable services not included so the work which is done by homemakers housewives what kind of service it is it is a unpaid service so unpaid service is not accounted in the private final consumption expenditure so can you see as to how we treat the non marketable goods and non marketable service non marketable goods are considered non marketable service as not uh, con considered got it so go back to the question expenditure on both marketable and non marketable services are included they are not included it is incorrect pfc account for the highest share correct so right answer in this case is 1 and 3 those of you who have gone the answer as one good look at this question it is pretty easy good akshay good chandrakant good nisha please read the question carefully some of you are still giving me the answer as uh, b please read the question carefully how is b and d different b says total exports of goods and service d says total imports and exports which is more correct d is more correct because that shows the trade to gdp ratio getting this okay next is gcf gross capital formation gross capital formation i have already discussed this in the last year's economic survey so those of you who have not watched the budget and economic survey of last year let me tell you that the budget and economic survey of last year is equally important for the prelims examination of this year as well so in case if you have not watched it please do watch it because it is quite important to make you go through budget and economic survey let me give you an example because you will not simply believe me for example there was a topic called as icr icr as you know stand for interest coverage ratio this was asked in the previous year prelims examination but let me tell you this interest coverage ratio was introduced uh, at least 2 years before in the year the uh, question was asked in the upsc prelims so it is asked from the previous year's economic survey so that way you can easily got questions from the previous year budget as well as economic survey that is why please go through these topics 
So I've discussed this gross capital formation. I've discussed the trends in gross capital formation. I've discussed the trends in gross domestic savings. These topics I've already discussed. So let's quickly look at this practice question. What do you think is the answer quickly? Please read the question carefully. Some of you are giving me the answer as D. What am I asking? Focus here. I'm asking what is included in gross fixed capital formation. I'm asking GFCF. I'm not asking GCF. So when I say gross fixed capital formation, it includes buying of machinery and equipment and it includes the research and development. It does not include changes in stocks or inventories. So can you see this? Gross capital formation is GFCF plus changes in inventories plus valuables. GFCF is what I have asked. So GFCF includes assets, machinery, research and development and cultivated biological resources. Okay. Practice MCQ number six. It says which among the following can lead to increase in net financial savings of the households. The word which is important is net financial savings. So how do you calculate net financial savings? Net financial savings can be calculated as total assets of the households minus total liabilities. If the net financial savings has to increase, what should happen to assets? Assets of the household should increase. What should happen to liabilities? Liabilities should reduce. So read the question carefully and tell me what is the answer. Good Abhidhya, good Utibaran, good Shivangi, good Kamal Preet, good Abhishek, Pratik, good. I hope this answer is easy, right? So it says increase in deposits by the households to the banks. If households are depositing money with the banks, for household what it is? A asset. But for the bank what it is? Liability. It says increase in deposits, so assets is increasing. Increase in loans given by banks to households. If I'm a household, if I'm taking loan, the loan for me is what? Liability, right? So it is leading to increase in liability. So it is incorrect. Higher investment by households in government securities. If I am making investment in government securities, for me, my asset is increasing. So right answer is 1 and 3. Did you get the point, all of you? Right? That is how you must solve the questions. So when you read the question, it might seem difficult to you. You just have to break down the question and you will get the right answer easily. Okay. Now, we are going to discuss one important term which is used in the economic survey this year, dollar index. So let's understand what is dollar index. Okay. To make your understanding about dollar index, let me first uh, quickly revise as to how do you calculate rate of inflation in the Indian economy? How do you measure rate of inflation? So to measure rate of inflation, what we do is we take into account a basket of commodities. For example, if I want to measure CPI, consumer price index, how much uh, goods and services are we taking into account? Any idea? How many goods and services are accounted under CPI? CPI is measuring inflation in 299 and uh, WPI is measuring inflation in 697 commodities. Some of you are mentioning 297, it's not 297, 299. Please remember this. Second, after taking into account a basket of commodities, we will fix a base year, which is right now 2011 12. And third, what we do is 
to each of these commodities included in CPI will assign a weightage. Weightage is assigned to each of these 299 commodities in such a way that the commodities are more frequently bought. The frequently bought commodities will have a higher weightage. The commodities are less frequently bought will have a lower weightage. Now, for example, say fruits and vegetables is something that you buy frequently. So, we will assign a higher weightage. On the other hand, let's say TV, refrigerator, we don't uh, buy frequently. So, it will have a lower weightage. So, we will assign weightage to all of these 299 commodities such, a, such that the total weightage is always equal to 100. This is how we measure inflation, right? And uh, if the value of inflation, if the value of inflation is increasing, it means that the prices of goods is increasing. If the value is reducing, then we say that the prices of goods is reducing. Yeah, the clear is up. I just uh, recall, help you recall as to how we measure inflation in India. Let's apply the same logic to concept of dollar index. Now we know that US economy is involved in trade with different different countries and not necessarily all of that trade is carried out in terms of dollars. It might be carried out in terms of different different currencies. For example, US might be involved in trade with Europe, Europe. so there it will be involved in uh, euro trade with uh, UK maybe in terms of pound trade in terms of uh, Canada can be involved in terms of Canada dollar right so US when it is involved in trade it is not just involved in trade in terms of dollar other currencies might also be included so here just like how for measuring CPI and WPI we are choosing a basket of commodities here to measure dollar index we take into account a basket of currencies and right now, we are taking into account six different currencies. For example, it includes Euro, Pond, Canada, Dollars. Then it will include the Japanese Yen. Then it will include the Swedish Krona. So some of these currencies are included. Not really important as to uh, which all currencies are included. Just have to know that there are six currencies included. And then we choose a base here. And third is we will assign weightage to each of these currencies. Now can you guess on what basis we are assigning current, uh, weightage to these six currencies? What could be the basis here? Yahan pe the basis is which commodities are more frequently bought? To that commodities we are uh, giving a higher weightage. Here the weightage is in terms of good percentage of trade carried out by US with each of these countries. Percentage of trade carried by US with Euro. Let's say it is in terms of say 30%. So Euro will get 30% weightage. Pond might get 25% weightage because trade of US with UK is in terms of 25% of its global trade. So we will assign weightage to each of this such that total weightage is equal to 100. Getting this point? Okay. Now, here I'm saying that if the value increases, prices is increasing. Same logic. If dollar index value is increasing, what do you think does it mean? If dollar index value is increasing, what do you think it does it mean? It's not that trade is increasing. What has happened to value of dollar vis-a-vis -vis these six currencies? Value of dollar vis-a-vis -vis these six currencies has increased. Dollar appreciation. Any idea? Why do you think value of dollar could have increased? Can I link it to the Fed bank policy? What action do you think the what policy the Fed Bank is following such that the dollar value is appreciated? Quantitative easing or tapering. Think of it. 
tapering. For example, if US Fed Bank is going for quantitative easing, what is happening to dollar supply? Dollar supply is going to increase, consequent to which dollar value is going to fall down. Whereas if US Fed Bank is going for tapering, dollar supply is going to reduce because of which dollar value is going to increase. So we'll come back here. So here the dollar will appreciate if US Fed Bank is following Fed tapering. Getting this point, all of you? On the other hand, if dollar index value is falling down, it means the dollar has depreciated. Depreciated vis a vis what? Depreciated vis a vis this six currencies. And that is because of the quantitative easing by US Fed Bank. Are we clear? I hope there are no doubts here in this case. Asane, I have tried to simplify this as much as possible. Shubham, you look confused. Shubham Singh. Yeah, okay. Yogesh, Suraj Kumar, are we clear? Okay. Now, what kind of questions can we get in the UPSC prelims examination? One, a direct question about what is dollar index. That is one. Second type of question could be application based question with respect to dollar index. That is, if dollar index increases or decreases, what is its impact on Indian economy? That is the question that you can expect. Impact of dollar index. And here, you don't have to worry much about it. What you must know, if agar dollar index value has increased, means dollar has appreciated. If dollar has appreciated vis-a-vis -vis this six currencies, obviously dollar value vis-a-vis -vis Indian rupee would also got appreciated. Similarly, if dollar value has depreciated vis-a-vis -vis this six currencies, it means dollar value vis-a-vis -vis rupee has also depreciated and rupee value has appreciated. Getting this point? Okay, let's quickly take up a question. Okay, with respect to dollar index, some of you are asking as to who evaluate dollar index. We are not the ones who are evaluating dollar index. It is evaluated or published by US. US Fed Bank does that. Do not worry about it. Okay. Look at this question. Quickly, what do you think is the answer? Which among the following ways does the increase in dollar index impact the Indian economy? Very good. Very good. So, rupee appreciation to bilkul nahi hai. It is rupee depreciation. Increase in current account deficit, yes, because the rupee value has depreciated. If rupee value has depreciated, imports into India have become costly. So there is increase in current account deficit. And if the dollar value is appreciating, that is, if US is falling Fed tapering, there will be an outflow of FPI leading to increase in bond yields. Good. Okay. Now coming to the concept of non-financial debt or core debt. Let's look into these things. Okay, debt we all know says how much money we have borrowed. This debt is categorized into two types, financial debt and non-financial debt. Financial debt is a money which has been borrowed by financial sector. So when I say financial sector, it is a money which is borrowed by banks and NBFCs. And this money they could have borrowed through issuance of bonds, debentures, etc. So that is a financial debt. But our focus is not on this financial debt. Our focus is on non-financial debt or it is also called as core debt. Now with respect to the core debt, I can see some of you are writing. You do not write because once the class is over, I will share the PPT to you. Do not worry about it. Okay? So just concentrate. With respect to non-financial debt or core debt, the non-financial debt or the core debt is any debt except the financial debt. Financial debt is a money which is borrowed by financial sector. 
if anyone apart from financial sector is borrowing money then that becomes the non financial debt or core debt for example it includes the government debt it includes the private non financial debt non financial debt means it's a money which is borrowed by non financial sector of a country non financial sector could include the companies which are involved in manufacturing sector the companies which are involved in services sector the companies which are involved in case of agriculture so anything except banks and nbfcs if that money is borrowed we will include this as private non financial debt and then there is a household debt and when i say government debt it includes borrowing by both center as well as states through various financial instruments like we know government borrows money through issuance of treasury bills cash management bills sdl state development loans so all of that is a government debt the government debt of both center and state it is around 85% so that is the government debt non financial debt for india it is 88% household debt is around 33% so all the time we have discussed so far only about the public debt of the center as well as states combined but if i take into account the debt of the private non financial sector as well as household sector what we get total debt is our core debt or called as non financial debt so you can see core debt or non financial debt is government debt plus private non financial debt plus household debt and uh, the economic survey has said that india's core debt as such is lower in comparison to the global average theek okay? hai so let's uh, take up a question asked in the prelims 2020 what do you think is answer here in the context of indian economy non financial debt includes which among the following yes total debt is more than 100% in fact it is more than 170% if you take into account only our public debt of both sentence state it is 85% housing loans taken by households yes outstanding on the credit card which is by households treasury bills is by government so right answer is 1 2 and 3 i hope this part is clear right so next time do not get confused if you get a question about core debt simply substitute core debt with the non financial debt so core debt will include the money of money borrowed by the government money borrowed by private non financial sector as well as households So you can see, eighty-five plus eighty-eight. It is almost like one seventy percent. One seventy plus thirty-three. It is like more than two hundred percent. But still, we are still happy because for other countries, as compared to other countries, our core debt is still lower. Okay. Finally, we are done with the first chapter of the economic survey. Archi Sharma is asking whether the such core debt is sustainable or not. Don't worry, that is what we are going to discuss in the next part. That it is indeed sustainable. Do not worry about it. <coughs> Pratik, I'll come to your doubt. Just hold on. now coming to the next uh, third chapter that is public finance as far as the second chapter is concerned the second chapter i will be discussing in the next week do not worry about it we'll take up the third chapter that is public finance here we'll quickly look into the basics of public finance that is revenue budget and capital budget types of fiscal policies then snapshot of government finances that is share of direct and indirect taxes trends in tax to gdp ratio and so on third is important terms and concepts used in the third chapter of economic survey that is concept of primary balance and a concept which is called as growth interest rate differential if you have seen my previous years economic survey discussion there i had used a concept of irgd irgd stands for interest rate growth differential but this year's budget to uh, economic survey to talk about whether india's debt is sustainable or not it uses another term called as growth interest rate differential need not worry about it 
both are same but how we calculate it that is different we'll discuss how is it different not worry and we'll also discuss the concept of tax buoyancy as well and last and most important is important tax proposals and you can see the important tax proposals of this year's budget which i think are important from the perspective of pilims is angel tax angel tax is the tax that is being imposed on startup companies and this has made a lot of news and you might get a question related to angel tax second is agnivir corpus fund long term capital gains tax on debt mutual funds because this is a topic which has been repeatedly appearing in the newspaper that is why it is important and changes to presumptive taxation so these are the things that i'm going to discuss so let's start with basics of public finance with respect to basics of public finance i hope everyone is aware about the article 112 of the indian constitution which says that the government has to present the budget under two heads that is revenue account and capital account and you have revenue receipts and capital receipts and revenue expenditure and capital expenditure so i have included here what is included in each of these accounts i hope you should be able to go through these things on your own right there's no need for me to explain this because there are two basics so let's take up those topics which are more important the basic things i presume that you are already aware and you would have read about these things similarly you know the fiscal deficit of india fiscal deficit of india is calculated as total expenditure minus revenue receipts plus non debt capital receipts so you can see in india total expenditure minus total receipts is always equal to zero which means re plus ce minus rr plus cr is equal to zero this is zero because the money that we borrow is included as part of capital receipts that is why it becomes equal to zero so keeping this as a background look at the definition of fiscal deficit total expenditure that is re plus ce minus rr plus non debt cr so what is left is this debt receipts so you can see debt receipts is the amount of money that we have borrowed in a single financial year concentrate on this how much money we have borrowed 17.5 lakh crore is what we have borrowed in the financial year 22 23 if you have borrowed money obviously we have to spend it somewhere we will spend it on re that is revenue expenditure and we will spend it under ce that is capital expenditure now question is how much money we will spend it on revenue account how much money that is we borrow and spend it under revenue account it is based upon how much is a shortage in the revenue account so you can see my revenue expenditure is 34.5 lakh crore and revenue receipts is 24 lakh crore so we have a deficit of how much 10.5 lakh crore so how is this deficit of 10.5 lakh crore financed it is financed from my fiscal deficit so out of this 17.5 lakh crore i have spent 10.5 lakh crore on the revenue expenditure to bacha kitna mere paas 7 lakh crore so where are we spending majority of our borrowings majority of borrowings we are spending on revenue expenditure and very less money on the capital expenditure which clearly shows that the quality of fiscal deficit in india is quite poor are we clear with this okay similarly let's look at this concept of fiscal balance and primary balance now these are the concepts that we don't use it in india in india we use the concept of fiscal deficit and primary deficit but this is a concept which is used by imf so look at fiscal balance fiscal balance is denoted as total receipts of the government minus total expenditure if receipt is more than expenditure it means a particular country has higher fiscal surplus jyada paisa hai which is not the case with india we know because in india it is the reverse in india our expenditure is more than the receipts so for india the fiscal balance is what negative so in india what we have is a concept of fiscal deficit and not fiscal surplus balance so what you must know fiscal balance as far as india is concerned it is nothing but fiscal deficit similarly primary balance 
is nothing but primary deficit in India. We know how we calculate primary deficit. Primary deficit is calculated as fiscal deficit minus interest payment on the public debt of the government. So, how much money we have borrowed from that borrowed money? Uh, how much uh, money we have paid as interest on my previous loans that tells us the primary deficit. Now, for example, if you see my overall liabilities, the total liabilities of the government, this liabilities of the government is somewhere around 150 lakh crore. This is a total amount of money which we have borrowed. So, every year we have to pay some interest, right? Any idea how much interest are we paying on an annual basis? If you have borrowed 17.5 lakh crore, so how much interest are you paying? Any idea on that? Anyone? Okay. Good. We are spending almost 9.5 lakh crore only on interest payment every year. So you can see my fiscal deficit is 17.5 lakh crore. From that, if I deduct 9.5 lakh crore I am will be left with almost like 8 lakh crore which is my primary deficit getting this point so this primary deficit for india is simply uh, the primary balance for india is simply the primary deficit so do not get confused if you get a question related to primary balance <laughs> now coming to types of fiscal policies this is a topic which I have already discussed in the previous econo uh, year's economic survey. I have discussed about what are counter cyclical and pro cyclical fiscal policies. So let's uh, quickly take up some questions related to pro cyclical and counter cyclical. Look at this question. What do you think is the answer? Question is very easy. This policy is adopted only during inflation, not necessarily. This policy could be adopted to counter recession or inflation. Upon the adoption of this policy, the money supply may increase or decrease. It can be possible. So, if I adopt counter cyclical policy to counter recession, the money supply will increase. If you adopt counter cyclical policy to counter inflation, the money supply could reduce. So, this is correct. What about this question? Take your time. I told you a trick how to solve such questions. The trick is remove the word not. Solve this as a normal question. And instead of finding out the correct options, find out the incorrect options. Take your time. Good Vitasta. Bablu Raj, you need to check your answer. Good Manish, good Palash, good Aditi, good Shamu, good Anjali, good Lokna, Aishwarya, Surbi, Aditi. Good. Saurav, just check your answer. Good Tushar. Okay. Ritubaran, good. So look at this. Which of the following measures are not likely to be taken by the government as part of counter cyclical fiscal policy during inflation? So let's remove the word not and solve this as a normal question. Which actions is likely to be taken by the government as part of counter cyclic fiscal policy during inflation? During inflation, what should happen to money supply? Money supply should reduce. To reduce money supply, tax rate should increase and expenditure by the government should reduce. So the first one says decrease in tax rate, which is incorrect. Cut down on government expenditure, it is correct. Provide higher tax exemptions, what we should do to counter inflation. To counter inflation, we must reduce the tax exemptions so that people are paying more taxes. So this is incorrect. So the word is not. Since the word is not, instead of finding out the right options, you need to find out the incorrect options. So incorrect options is 1 and 3. So do not get confused if you come across the word not. Bas not ko hata do. Solve the question as a normal question. Then, instead of finding out the correct options, find out the incorrect options. Getting this? Okay. 
What do you think is this question? Answer to this question. Let's just check your answer. Which among the following can be considered as counter cyclical fiscal policy? Okay. Increase in government expenditure during recession. During recession, if you increase government expenditure, it is counter cyclical, correct? Increase in government expenditure during economic boom. Economic boom means inflation. During inflation, what we must do to government expenditure? Government expenditure come on reduce on incorrect. Decrease in government's expenditure during recession. During recession, the government expenditure should increase. Incorrect. Decrease in government's expenditure during economic boom? Yes. If there's an inflation, we must reduce the government expenditure. So, right answer is 1 and 4. What do you think about this? So some of you are asking from where to read counter cyclical and pro cyclical. Like I said, I have discussed this in detail in the last year's economic survey. Please go through that. You'll get a fair amount of idea on that. Okay. Which among the following steps are not likely to be taken by the government or the RBI to promote economic growth? Word is not. So not ko likadu. Which among the following are likely to be taken to promote economic growth? So we will not adopt monetary policy tightening. We'll rather use what policy? Accommodative policy, adopt counter cyclical fiscal policy. Correct. Will we will the RBI reduce the repo rate? Yes, RBI will reduce the repo rate to promote growth. RBI will also decrease the rep reverse repo also. So here the question is not not means one. Clear? Okay. Now coming to snapshot of government's finances. So let's quickly look at. The snapshot of government finances, the total budget size in the year 22-23 was 42 lakh crores. Look at the revenue receipts, 24 lakh crore and capital receipts, 18 lakh crore. 24 plus 18, how much is this? 42. Capital ex revenue expenditure, 34.5 plus 7.5, how much it is? 42. So like I said, in India, my total expenditure is always equal to total receipts. The reason is the borrowings of the government is always included as part of receipts in India. So you can see my total gross tax revenue is 30 lakh crore. And in prelims, what is important is to note what is the share of direct taxes and indirect taxes. You can see the share of direct taxes is higher than the share of indirect taxes. This is the first important pointer that you should know. Second, if you look at the decreasing order of taxes, the tax which accounts for the highest share is GST. And when I say GST, GST includes the central GST, union territory GST and GST compensation cess. All of this put together is the highest, followed by corporate tax and income tax. So just remember the order of taxes, GST, corporate tax and income tax. And then look at the net tax revenue. Net tax revenue is calculated as gross tax revenue. From that, we will deduct the share, state share of taxes and transfer to NDRF. So we know that whatever tax the central government collects based upon the recommendations of the finance commission, the central government will transfer the tax to the states. So that we are deducting and we will also deducting the transfer to NDRF. What we are left with is net tax revenue. And you can see my total debt receipts, borrowings. I told you fiscal deficit of India is 17.5 lakh crores. Okay. And uh, like I said, the interest payment in India is around 9.4, which is uh, like around 9.5 lakh crore, which is the highest. Grants to the state for creation of assets is 3 lakh crore. So you can see revenue deficit is 10.5 lakh crore. That is 34.5 lakh crore minus 24 lakh crore. 
effective revenue deficit effective revenue deficit is revenue deficit minus the grants that we give to state for creation of assets so 10.5 minus 3 it's 7.5 so this is like 2.9 percent of gdp fiscal deficit is 17.5 primary deficit like i said 17.5 lakh crore is what we have borrowed out of that 9.5 lakh crore we have spent on uh, repaying interest on the previous loans so the primary deficit is 8 lakh crore and last one is effective capital expenditure i have already discussed this in the budget effective capital expenditure is how much money the central government is spending on creation of assets plus how much grants the center is giving to states on creation of assets please do understand effective capital expenditure does not include what the money which the states are on their own are spending on creation of assets so as far as these topics these things are concerned you just have to know the formula for calculating the deficits absolute value is not important it's just for your understanding okay okay so decreasing out of taxes you can see gst higher than corporate tax followed by income tax decreasing order of expenditure highest expenditure for interest payments followed by state share of taxes so one important thing is the amount of interest that we pay on the previous loans is higher than the state share of taxes coming to the next part trends in tax receipts of the government you can see with respect to tax receipts my total direct tax collection is six percent of gdp indirect tax collection is 5.1 so direct tax plus indirect tax the total tax to gdp ratio of india is 11.1 percent so it's fluctuating in the last uh, say five years and good thing is when you don't see a particular trend you don't have to mug up anything because you just know that it is fluctuating you not worry about it okay ups is not going to ask you on that okay look at this next part sources of deficit financing which means if we have borrowed 17.5 lakh crore which is a major source of government borrowings you can see the market borrowings kitna hai 12.5 lakh crore is a money that the government has borrowed from market from market how does the government borrow money the market borrowings is through government securities that is dated securities we know about it but look at the second most component important company securities against small savings securities against small savings means when people deposit their money in small savings schemes like post office deposit kisan vikas patra sukanya samriddhi account and so on that money the government takes out and makes investment in government securities so government is in a way directly borrowing money from the household savings of the people so that is the second largest component so please remember that point okay let's take up some questions read this question what do you think is the answer read the question carefully you need to find out the incorrect ones so in case if you are not revised please revise thoroughly okay so look read the first statement center and state can raise short term loans through issuance of treasury bills Now this was a statement which was also asked in the previous year prelims also. Treasury bills can be issued only by whom? Treasury bills can be issued only by center, not the state government. Treasury bills are interest bearing. They are not interest bearing. Treasury bills are issued at discount to the face value, right? So this is incorrect. Only the center can raise long term loans through issuance of government securities. No, apart from center. the states can also raise long term loans through issuance of sdls so incorrect are 1 2 and 3 are we clear okay read this question what do you think is the answer floating rate bonds
गुड वॉट आर फ्लोटिंग रेट बॉन्ड्स सी वेन द गवर्नमेंट इश्यूज डेटेड सिक्योरिटीज गवर्नमेंट कैन इश्यू टू टाइप्स ऑफ डेटेड सिक्योरिटीज फिक्सड रेट डेटेड सिक्योरिटीज एंड फ्लोटिंग रेट डेटेड सिक्योरिटीज फिक्सड रेट डेटेड सिक्योरिटीज मीन्स कूपन रेट इज फिक्सड दैट डज नॉट चेंज फ्लोटिंग रेट मीन्स कूपन रेट और द इंटरेस्ट पेमेंट ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट माइट चेंज सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल यू हैव वन टाइप ऑफ बॉन्ड्स विच द गवर्नमेंट कैन इश्यू कॉल्ड एज कैपिटल इंडेक्सड बॉन्ड्स it has not issued these capital index bonds now but it has issued the capital index bonds in the past capital index bonds means the coupon rate in this case will change according to rate of inflation so here the coupon rate is not fixed so you can see the floating rate bonds issued by the government do not carry a fixed coupon rate it is correct because the coupon rate might change depending upon the rate of inflation majority of loans are through issuance of floating rate bonds majority of loans of the government are issued through fixed rate bonds floating rate bonds right now as per economic survey account for just 1.7% of the money raised by the government so <coughs> answer is one only so for benefit of other students i have included this particular uh, uh, slide in which i have highlighted what kind of government securities are issued by center as well as states Look at this practice question. Good, good Divek, good Lokna, good Ritiburan, good Sulayraj, good Bablu, good Abudya, good Viva. Okay, just focus here. The securities against NSSF account for the largest share. No, it is the market borrowings. A uh, increase in nominal GDP is likely to decrease fiscal deficit. How? There are two ways. How? Increase in nominal GDP is likely to decrease fiscal deficit. If nominal GDP has increased, it means that the tax collection of the government has increased, right? As the government has collected more tax. the need for the government to borrow money has got reduced so fiscal deficit has reduced that way but second also mathematically also the fiscal deficit is likely to reduce how mathematically it is likely to reduce because when we express fiscal deficit we express fiscal deficit in terms of what in terms of percentage of gdp right which gdp are we talking about real gdp or nominal gdp anyone when we express fiscal deficit as say 6.5% of gdp what gdp are we talking about nominal gdp right now for example say in the year 22 and 23 let's say the borrowing of the government is equal to rupees 20 and here also the government has borrowed same amount of money but when i express this in terms of percentage of gdp the value might change for example my nominal gdp in the year 22 is equal to 100 and in the year 23 it is equal to rupees 200 so let's see the fiscal deficit fiscal deficit in this case will be 20% of gdp and yahan pe kitna rahega it will be 10% of gdp so the amount of money that we have borrowed is same but why it has got changed it has changed because the nominal gdp has increased getting this point so that is why the second statement is correct the fiscal deficit of the government exclude external borrowing no it also includes external borrowings so right answer is 2 are we clear all of you okay look at this fiscal slippage fiscal slippage means only increase in fiscal deficit of the government as simple as that you do not get confused fiscal slippage means increase in fiscal deficit if government's fiscal deficit is increased then we call it as fiscal slippage so decrease in government borrowings 
will not lead to fiscal slippage right increase in tax revenue will also not lead to fiscal slippage decrease in nominal gdp yes it will lead to fiscal slippage so right answer kya hai yahan pe good anjali the right answer is c are we clear okay sir pratik is asking about ex ecb by the government let me tell you government does not borrow money through external commercial borrowing external commercial borrowing is only by corporate entities corporate entities means private sector plus the government owned companies the government never goes for ecb external commercial borrowings why do we include in fiscal deficit because fiscal deficit includes the total borrowings of the government be it internal debt or external debt got it pratik government borrowings so government securities will always be part of financial debt sorry non non financial debt core debt then i clear okay now coming to debt status of the government ritu barin asking whether the public sector external commercial borrowing come under the public debt of the government no the public debt of the government is purely the money which the government has borrowed government owned companies if they are borrowing money it is not considered to be part of public debt please do understand that okay look at the debt status of the government this is same as last year my total liabilities is 152 lakh crore and i told you what's my nominal gdp anyone we just discussed what's my nominal gdp in terms of absolute value yes it is 270 lakh crore so i can see my total liabilities is almost like 60% of gdp this is like 60% so out of this public debt and liabilities under public account of india this is 53% and this is like 6% public debt includes internal debt as well as external debt internal debt is 51% of gdp external debt is 2% so between internal debt and external debt which is more internal debt is more within the internal debt which is for the highest share highest share is dated securities and this was what was asked in the prelims 2022 and you can see the special government securities that we issue it is always part of the government's public debt but in some cases it can be part of fiscal deficit and in some cases it is not part of fiscal deficit for example sovereign gold bond it is always part of fiscal deficit always government itself says that it is part of our fiscal deficit but recapitalization bond it is not part of fiscal deficit similarly oil bonds which the government issues is also not part of fiscal deficit okay and you can see with respect to external debt loans for multilateral institutions account for the highest share so let's quickly look at the debt to gdp ratio it has was around 63% in the year 2004 from that it got reduced we are talking about union's government union government debt to gdp ratio it got reduced and then now it has increased to 59% because of covid 19 on the other hand if you look into the general government liabilities general government liabilities means the total liabilities of center as well as states and i told you how much it is 85% so center's debt is around 60% states debt is around 25% 60 plus 25 is 85 and what is our target to reduce the public debt under frbm act hope you have read about this the target is to reduce it to 60% out of the 60% the center's government debt should be reduced to 40% states should be reduced to 20% i hope this are clear right okay look at this question what do you think is the answer
क्वेश्चन इज वेरी इजी विच एम मतलब फॉलोइंग आर इंक्लूडेड इन पब्लिक डेट ऑफ द सेंटर पब्लिक डेट ऑफ द सेंटर इंक्लूड्स इंटरनल डेट एज वेल एज एक्सटर्नल डेट इट डज नॉट इंक्लूड द लाइब्रिटीज अंडर पब्लिक अकाउंट ऑफ इंडिया नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इजी है राइट सो द इंटरनल डेट ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट इज हायर देन एक्सटर्नल डेट येस द इंटरनल डेट इज डॉमिनेटेड बाय सिक्योरिटीज अगेंस्ट एन एस एस एफ नो इट इज डॉमिनेटेड बाय द गवर्नमेंट सिक्योरिटीज डेटेड सिक्योरिटीज गुड फाइन नाउ कमिंग टू अ इंपॉर्टेंट कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ दिस इज इकोनॉमिक सर्वे सो लेट्स कॉन्सेंट्रेट हिया वी ऑल नो दैट द कंट्रीज अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड हैव बॉरोड मोर अमाउंट ऑफ मनी in the aftermath of covid-19 pandemic which in turn has led to increase in their overall public debt for example if you look at japan japan's public debt in the year 2005 was 174 and look what it has happened to its public debt in the year 2021 it has increased to 263% of its gdp which is extremely high and look at us US public debt in the year 2005 was 66 percent. Now it has increased to 128 percent. And what is India's public debt? It is around 85 percent, both combined debt of center and states. So as compared to other countries, can I say we are still very good, right? That is the first thing. Second thing is by what extent the public debt of India has increased in the last say 15 years? In other countries. it has increased by large margin but in india in last 15 to 16 years it has increased by just 3% which is once again very good for us the reason as to why it has only increased by 3% is in between these 15 years we have reduced our public debt because we reduced our public debt we had more fiscal space to borrow money during the covid-19 pandemic right but other countries did not had that kind of flexibility because other countries had borrowed already more amount of money so this year economic survey talks about debt sustainability of the indian economy one of you was asking whether so much amount of debt for india whether it is sustainable or not will we be able to repay the loans or not to understand about debt sustainability that is whether india can repay the loans or not there are two things that we need to focus upon one is interest rate growth differential which is called as irgd this was introduced by the economic survey 2020 2021 and second one is growth interest rate differential which is been talked about in this year's economic survey and let me tell you both the concepts are same the only difference is how we calculate these two concepts here what is the first word interest and what is the second word growth so how will you calculate this it is calculated as interest rate minus growth rate gdp growth rate here what's the first word growth that is gdp growth and what's the second word interest rate so how will you calculate this gdp growth rate minus interest rate so to make it much more easier let's take up the explanation which i have already done it in last year's economic survey but for benefit of all to make this this uh, distinction much more clear let me quickly help you to recall those things let's say we have already borrowed 1000 rupees and now we borrow additional 100 rupees at rate of interest of 8% for 10 years we make investment in capital assets from which we are generating revenues worth 112 my rate of interest is how much 8% what is my rate of returns a rate of returns is equal to 12% interest rate is 8% but rate of returns is 12% so can i say my rate of returns is much higher than the rate of interest at which i am we are borrowing loans so because of this since we are getting more amount of money we can repay our existing borrowing of rupees 108 and we are left with how much 4 rupees if you are left with 4 rupees what we can do with this 4 rupees one we can repay this existing debt of 1000 rupees and we can also make additional investment in creation of assets and promote gdp growth rate 
now this entire cycle is possible only when the rate of returns is higher than the rate of interest at which government is borrowing money now if i want to find out rate of returns for us can i say it is simply my gdp growth rate and this is the rate of interest on government securities that the government is borrowing money right so now to understand this debt sustainability we can read this for debt to be sustainable the rate of returns that is gdp growth rate should be higher than the rate of interest on loans so to know this there is one concept interest rate growth differential it stand for irgd how we calculate this it is calculated as interest rate minus gdp growth rate i told you gdp growth rate should be more than what interest rate so ideally this interest rate growth differential kya hona chahiye minus negative hona chahiye so let me take two examples of irgd there is one country with plus 2% irgd and another country with plus minus 2 irgd country a and country b which country is debt is more sustainable b country's debt is more sustainable irgd one country's is minus 2 another country's irgd is minus 10 which is more sustainable in this case minus 10 so can i say more negative the value of irgd it is better for a country hold on to this look at this word growth interest rate differential how do you calculate this growth rate minus interest rate so this gird ye hamesha kya hona chahiye positive concept is same but how we calculate it is different mathematically so with respect to gird one country is plus 2 and other country is this minus 2 yahan pe kaun sa country ka better hai gird plus 2 a gird one country is is plus 2 and another country is is plus 10 which country is gird is better this plus 10 did you understand this concept all of you right so do not get confused economy survey has tried to confuse you by using a different concept of growth interest rate differential bas formula mein you just have to remember kaun sa word pehla hai what is the first word that word minus the second word will give you the formula so do not get confused interest rate growth differential means first word is interest interest rate minus growth rate growth interest rate differential means first word is growth growth minus interest do not get confused so to further give you clarity on this let's take up two questions with respect to irgd and gird the things will much become much more crystal clear let's take up questions look at this mcq number 17 which among the following are associated with the positive growth interest rate differential positive values positive gird growth minus interest rate positive hona chahiye negative hona chahiye positive hona chahiye right so lower debt sustainability no, no, nahi hai higher gdp growth rate yes enhanced capacity to provide fiscal stimulus yes right answer is 2 and 3 only look at the next practice question with reference to interest rate growth differential that going to confuse here interest rate which means how do you find it out interest rate minus growth rate higher positive value of irgd denotes higher debt sustainability no negative value of irgd is associated with the poor capacity to provide fiscal stimulus no right so answer is neither one not two clear hai i hope this part is clear okay good now coming to the concept of tax buoyancy i remember someone was asking about what is tax buoyancy at the start of the class let's get into this concept of what exactly is tax buoyancy concentrate here about tax buoyancy let's say 
in the year 22-23, the total tax collections of the government was equal to rupees hundred. Subsequent to which, there was increase in my GDP growth rate by five percent. So what happens if there is increase in GDP growth rate? Can I say tax collections will increase? Why will tax collection increase? Because if GDP growth rate is increasing, it means two things. One, people are buying more goods and services. If people are buying more goods and services, automatically GST collections will increase. Similarly, if GDP increases, people's income level is going to increase. If people's income level is increasing, the amount of income tax that we are going to collect will also increase. Right? So, increase in GDP growth rate will obviously lead to increase in my tax collection. That is one way. Apart from that, government might make certain changes in tax policies. And because of those changes in tax policies, the tax collection could increase. Now, for example, the government can include more number of people in the tax bracket. We can include, uh, increase our tax base. We can increase the tax rates. Government can improve the efficiency of tax collection or government can crack down on black money. Because of these reasons also, can I say the tax collection of the government could increase, right? So there are two independent reasons as to why tax collection could increase. On one hand, tax collection could increase because of increase in my GDP growth rate and tax collection could increase because of changes in tax policies. Now, let's say because of these two reasons combined effect in the next financial year as compared to the year 22-23, tax collection is rupees 110. Last year it was 100, now it is 110. So, what is the percentage change in tax collection? 10%. So, my tax collection has increased by 10%. But why it has increased by 10%? Can I say it has increased by 10% because of two reasons. One, it has increased because of change in GDP also and because of changes in tax policies also. Now, how do I calculate tax buoyancy? Now, this is very interesting. Tax buoyancy is calculated as percentage change in tax collection divided by percentage change in GDP. Now, when I say percentage change in tax collection, why has the tax collection increased? It has increased because of two reasons. Change in GDP as well as the changes in tax policies. Together, by what extent my tax revenue has increased? 10%. But what is my change in GDP? 5%. So, 10% divided by 5% is equal to 2. Tax buoyancy is never ever expressed in terms of percentage. It is always expressed in terms of absolute value. So, if I have to explain in simple English, or what is tax buoyancy of 2? It means every 1% increase in my nominal GDP growth rate has led to 2% increase in the tax collection. And this 2% increase in tax collection is why? Is it only because of GDP? No. This 2% increase in tax collection is also because of changes in tax policies. Are we clear with this concept of tax buoyancy? Right? So, it's the most simplest way. I just take into account in the numerator by what extent my tax revenue has increased. Tax revenue could have increased because of changes in tax policies or because of changes in GDP. And I measure this with respect to changes in GDP. Clear with this? Okay. So, you can see this year's economic survey talks about tax buoyancy of indirect taxes prior to introduction of GST and post introduction of GST. Now, let's look at this part. We know that GST has subsumed almost around 17 indirect taxes and cesses. Now, if you look at those 17 indirect taxes which were in place before 2017. Why 2017? Because GST was introduced in the year 2017. So, if I look into these 17 indirect taxes before 2017, on an annual basis, the growth rate of these 17 indirect taxes was 11.53%. Every year they were increasing by 11.53. But annual nominal GDP growth rate 
was 11.54 percent. I told you how do you calculate tax buoyancy? Percentage change in tax revenue divided by percentage change in my nominal GDP. So, ये कितना है? 0.99. That is prior to GST. Now, all of these 17 indirect taxes have become part of GST in the year 2017. If you look at annual growth rate of indirect taxes, कितना है? 10.9. पहले कितना था? 11.53. What has happened to the annual growth rate of indirect taxes? It has reduced. But, but look at my annual nominal GDP growth rate. It has reduced. Earlier it used to be like 11.54. Now it is like 9.6. So one good thing is, in spite of decrease in the annual GDP growth rate of indirect taxes, the tax buoyancy has increased. Why tax balance is increased? Because the denominator, denominator ka value kya hai? Nominal GDP growth rate, this has got reduced. So that is why tax buoyancy of GST is now 1.12. Are we clear with this? Okay, please do remember this concept of tax buoyancy with respect to GST. <clears throat> Look at this question. Quickly, what do you think is the answer? If tax buoyancy is above 1, good Jay, good Akshay, good Shivangi, good Divek, good uh, Asna, good Abhidya, good Anjali Gaur. So, right answer is high response in of, of tax collection in response to either the GDP or changes in tax rate. Good. Okay. Now, I am going to take up a very very important discussion the discussion that i am going to take up is the topic of angel tax now before i take up this topic of angel tax let me tell you why is this topic important from the perspective of the prelims as well as mains examination in the previous year prelims there was question related to equalization levy apart from that there was a question related to capital gains tax now, why UPSC asked questions related to equalization levy and capital gains tax? Because it was in news that particular year. That is why it was asked in the prelims examination. Similarly, in the previous year mains examination, there was a 10 marker question about what are the implications of changes in dividend distribution tax and changes in long term capital gains tax now this was a question asked from the budget in the previous year mains examination so what i am trying to convey to you is when important changes are made with respect to taxes you could get a question either in the prelims examination or in the mains examination so taking it forward in this year budget there has been a important uh, change which has been made with respect to angel tax and this question on angel tax could be asked in prelims just like the way it was earlier asked with respect to equalization levy or capital gains tax or it could be asked in the pains examination so let's quickly understand what is angel tax let me tell you angel tax is a tax which is to be paid by startup companies in india and this is not a new tax that we have introduced this year. This tax was introduced way back in April of 2013. Almost like nine years back, we had introduced this angel tax. Now, in the budget of 23-24, what we have simply done is, we have expanded the ambit of angel tax. So, sabse pehle hum kya karenge? We'll first discuss as to why did we even impose angel tax first that is in the year 2013 and uh, what was the angel tax before that is before this year's budget and what is the present change in the angel tax so slowly one by one i will discuss these topics do not worry so in the next uh, say 15 minutes slowly one by one one by one i'll take up the topic discussion and by the end of this 15 minutes 
you'll have complete clarity with respect to what is angel tax how does it work who is paying all of these things you'll get to know okay you just need to have patience on this okay just look at this slide in india we can have two types of companies listed companies and unlisted companies listed companies are the companies which have already issued shares and shares of those companies are listed on the stock exchanges stock exchanges like bsc nsc and so on and these companies they have issued shares through ipo initial public offer so they have sold their shares to the public so a lot of people have bought these shares so it is an ipo so it is bought by large number of shareholders and if you want to know the market valuation of this company when i say market valuation of the company means what is the worth of this company i just have to know at is as the what is the price of this share in the market if the price of the share in the market has increased it means the market valuation of this company has increased if the price of this company has a price of share has fallen down the market valuation has fallen down now for example when you look at adani group adani group ka market valuation kya hua hai it has fallen down because of the hindenburg report right so for listed companies i can easily get to know what is their market valuation based upon the share price in the market that is that part clear okay now coming to the unlisted companies now this is what is more important because our focus is on unlisted companies now what are unlisted companies unlisted companies are those companies which have so far not issued shares or even if they have issued shares those shares are not traded on the stock exchange like bsn and nsc so you can see their shares are not listed on stock exchanges the shares these companies have issued they have not issued the shares through ipo they have issued shares through private placement how let me give an example let's say i own a startup company and let's consider you all are investors all of you are making investment in my company now what i will do is to each one of you when i take your capital money to each one of you i'll issue shares so this is what is called as private placement how is it different from ipo in ipo i'm selling shares to public but in this case i am taking money from certain category of investors and to those investors i am giving them shares private placement so the shares are bought only by few shareholders and look at this this is what we are going to focus upon fair market value now let's say i have started a new startup company which is into manufacturing of drones drones for the agriculture sector now for my startup company i need to find out what is the fair market valuation of my company that is how much is the worth of my company there is one way to find out the market valuation of a company scenario 1 wherein i need to take into account how much is my total net assets and what is my total liabilities presently but can i say for a startup company when it is initially growing the amount of assets it is has is very less so this is very unfair way to find out the market valuation of the company so how do you know what is the market valuation of this company here i need to take into account what is the present valuation of this company what is the present worth of this company that is what is the total asset what is the total liability plus i also need to take into account what is the future potential for growth of the startup company now for example right now there is very less demand for drones in agriculture but it might so happen that after 10 to 15 years the demand for drones in the agriculture can increase because of which my company can make more profits in future so there is huge potential for growth not now but in future getting this point so based upon future potential for growth we will find out the fair market valuation of my company the method that we use to estimate the fair market value of a company that method we call it as 
डिस्काउंटेड कैश फ्लो मेथड और बुक वैल्यू मेथड इफ यू आर वंडरिंग वॉट इज दिस मेथड हाउ आर वी गोइंग टू एस्टिमेट द फेयर मार्केट वैल्यू लेट मी टेल यू इट इज नॉट एट ऑल इंपॉर्टेंट बिकॉज यू आर नॉट प्रिपेयरिंग फॉर सी एग्जाम यू आर प्रिपेयरिंग फॉर द यूपीएससी प्रिलिम्स एग्जामिनेशन सो नॉट रियली इंपॉर्टेंट बट वॉट यू मस्ट नो इज देर इज अ मेथड बाय विच वी आर एस्टिमेटिंग द फेयर मार्केट वैल्यू द फेयर मार्केट वैल्यू इज बेस्ड अपॉन वॉट फ्यूचर पोटेंशियल फॉर ग्रोथ गेटिंग दिस पॉइंट ऑल ऑफ यू so this is one aspect i need to uh, make you understand now coming to this what is a startup in india startup is a company which is less than 10 years old and in this 10 years its annual turnover should not increase to more than 100 crores so both these two conditions should uh, simultaneously get satisfied my company should be less than 10 years old and in these 10 years the annual turnover should not exceed 100 crores in this 10 years if annual turnover exceeds 100 crores my company will no longer be considered as a startup company okay now this startup company can raise money from domestic investors as well as foreign investors and we know the people who invest money in startups what are they called as angel investors right now to these angel investors the startup company will issue the shares that is how the startup companies raise capital but what is the problem here okay please pay attention what is the problem with respect to problem it has been observed that a large number of startups in india uh, they have been set up in order to do money laundering when i say money laundering means they are able to convert their black money into white money how let's understand this now for example let's say there is a particular person a this person a has huge amount of black money for example he wants to convert his black money into white money so what this person a will do is he'll ask his friend or a family member let's say person b so person b is a friend or a family member of person a and this person b will be asked to start a new company startup company and let's say the fair market value of share of this particular company is equal to rupees 10 now like i said you don't have to get into know as to how this fair market value is calculated it is the responsibility of the income tax authorities to do that so when you get into irs probably they will get to know but right now you should know that we have calculated the fair market value of this company as rupees 10 so then what this person a will ask this person b is you sell me shares at a price which is above the fair market value which means here the startup company will sell shares to person a at rupees 20 what's the fair market value at 10 but it is selling it at rupees 20 above a fair market value so person a who has put black money who has black money he'll put his money in the new startup but now you'll be wondering wondering ye paisa kahan se aane wala hai how will it convert into white money so what he will do is once this money is put into startup this startup company will buy a high end luxury car let's say mercedes bmw and then this luxury car is registered in name of which company startup company but who will actually use it it will be actually used by the person a getting this point another example is this startup company might invest in a new building commercial building actually the building will be registered in the name of startup company but who is actually earning profit the person a so here this is how people have been able to do money laundering and so what happens is the startup companies they remain such startup companies they remain for 2 to 3 years after 2 to 3 years they close down their business and ultimately the assets such as cars buildings ultimately who will have control over those assets person a so yahan pe money laundering ho raha hai i'm not saying that all the startup companies are doing it but some startup companies are set up only for money laundering purpose you deliberately set up startup company get the black money convert that black money into uh, 
वाइट मनी क्लोज ऑन द कंपनी दैट्स इट आपका ब्लैक मनी व्हाइट मनी में कन्वर्ट हो गया यू आर हैप्पी आपके पास कार आ गया आपके पास बिल्डिंग आ गया सब कुछ आ गया गेटिंग दिस पॉइंट सो गवर्नमेंट गॉट टू नो कि ये सब चल रहा है तो व्हाट विल यू डू यूल इंपोज टैक्स ऑन सच कंपनी बट आर वी गोइंग टू इंपोज टैक्स ऑन ऑल द साइड ऑफ कंपनी थिंक ऑफ इट नो वेन विल यू इंपोज टैक्स You will impose tax only when the startup company raises capital at a price which is higher than the fair market value. And when did we first impose this tax? As I said, it was imposed way back in the year two thousand thirteen. So let's look into the angel tax. Look at this background of angel tax. First introduced through an amendment to Income Tax Act in the year two thousand twelve. and applicable from the april 1st 2013 tax is imposed on capital raised by startups but it is applicable only when the share price is more than the fair market value of shares only then otherwise we are not getting uh, no uh, angel tax is to be paid why it is introduced to prevent money laundering what is the tax rate tax rate is 30.9% of the excess amount received over and above the fair market value and this is something which is a little complicated to understand so for which what i have done is i have given an example to ex uh, explain this concentrate here fair market value of a share of a startup company is rupees 100 like i said fair market value who will calculate this the income tax authorities how it is calculated discounted cash flow method or book value method actual calculation not important right so the fair market value is rupees 100 investors are buying share at 150 so this condition is getting fulfilled share price is above the market value so excess amount received over and above the fair market value kitna hai 50 rupees so how much tax will you pay this startup company 30.9% of how much rupees 50 as angel tax look at the earlier exemption earlier this angel tax was required to be paid by this startup company only when it was raising capital from domestic investors it is not required to pay this angel tax if it was raising capital from foreign investors so you can see here if there is a startup company it is raising capital from domestic investors as well as foreign investors on the capital raised from domestic investors it was applicable whereas angel tax was not applicable if capital is raised from the foreign investors don't you think it is very unfair it's quite unfair because if money laundering is taking place by the domestic investors it can very well take place by foreign investors also so now tell me what kind of modification we could have done in the new angel tax kya kiya hoga humne both you have said both now you raise capital from domestic investors or foreign investors both we have to impose the you will have to pay the angel tax now some of you are still asking me how do you calculate fair market value maine do bar nahi teen bar nahi char bar aapko bataya hai fair market value ka calculation is by a book value method or discounted cash flow method it is not a ca exam which you are preparing for it's a upsc prelims examination तो यूपीएससी कभी पूछने वाला नहीं है कि कैलकुलेट द फेयर मार्केट वैल्यू ऑफ सो एंड सो स्टार्टअप कंपनी ओके आर वी क्लियर विद दिस सो कैन सी न्यू बजट प्रपोजल इज अप्लीकेबल टू कैपिटल रेस फ्रॉम बोथ डोमेस्टिक एज वेल एज फॉरेन इन्वेस्टर्स याद रहेगा एंजल टैक्स practice mcq number 21 venture capitalists and angel investors are both same abhilash a company is considered startup for up to 5 years with annual turnover not exceeding rupees 500 100 crores it's not 5 years kitna saal hai 10 years the startup india scheme is implemented by ministry of commerce and industry it is indeed implemented by ministry of commerce and industry it is not by ministry of finance
The angel tax has been introduced for the first time in 22 23 to an amendment to income tax act. No, it's not the first time. Angel tax is applicable to both listed and unlisted companies. No, it is listed only for whom? Unlisted companies. Third, the angel tax has been made applicable to capital raised from both domestic and foreign investors. Yes. Earlier it was applicable only for domestic investors. Now it is for both domestic as well as foreign investors. I hope this part of angel tax is clear. Right? This tax is imposed only when the startup company is issuing shares at a price above the fair market value. If a startup company is raising capital at a fair market value, no angel tax is to be imposed. Okay. Now coming to the tax on long term debt mutual funds. So recently the government has made certain changes with respect to long term capital gains tax on debt mutual funds. So look at the word changes on long term capital gains tax on debt mutual funds. So let's look at this word capital gains tax. What is capital gains tax? Capital gains tax is the tax which people pay on profits which they make by selling an asset. Whenever I sell an asset, by selling an asset if I am making profit, a part of that profit I have to pay to the government as capital gains tax. Now for example, in the year 22, I bought a share at rupees 10. In the year 23, I am selling this share at rupees 20. I made a profit of rupees 10. So government says, if you have made profit, I need to get a share of that profit. Your profit is my profit. But here what you must know is capital gains tax will come into play only when you make a profit. If you make a loss, no capital gains tax. So it's like government saying your profit is my profit, your loss is your loss. Okay. So let's understand this concept of what is the long term capital gains tax on debt mutual fund. Okay. I hope everyone knows what is mutual fund, right? Mutual fund means it's a company which takes money from investors and after taking money from the investors, that money is invested in different, different financial instruments like shares, bonds and so on. So here we have predominantly two types of mutual fund companies, equity mutual funds and debt mutual funds. Equity mutual funds are those mutual funds where the mutual funds are investing more than 65% money in shares. Debt mutual funds are more than 65% of money is invested in bonds, government securities. Which means equity mutual funds can make investment in both shares as well as bonds. But where is the majority investment? Shares. They can make investment in both shares and bonds. But where is the majority investment? Bonds. Right? Okay. Now, on the equity mutual funds, we have both short term capital gains tax and long term capital gains tax. Short term capital gains tax comes into play if I buy and sell a mutual fund unit within one year, short term. Long term capital gains tax will come into play if I buy and sell a mutual fund unit after one year. Let me give an example. In the Feb 2023, I bought mutual fund unit at Rs. 100. March 2023, which is within one year, in the immediately next month, I am selling mutual fund unit at 150. What is my profit? 50 rupees. So you can see what is the tax rate? 15%. So 15% of rupees 50, that is 7.5, I need to pay as capital gains tax. What is long term capital gains tax? Feb 2023, I bought a mutual fund unit at 100. In March 2024, I am selling a mutual fund unit at 150. Look at the time gap. Can I say I am selling the mutual fund unit after more than one year? After more than one year, if I am selling, what is applicable? Long term capital gains tax. How much is it? 10%. So you can see how much profit I have made? 50 rupees. So capital gains tax is 10% of rupees 50, that is rupees 5. Can you see? Here also I am making 50 rupees profit. Here also I am making 50 rupees profit. But where I am paying less tax? Long term capital gains tax. So long term capital gains tax rate is lower as compared to short term capital gains tax. Kya reason ho sakta hai? 
Why? It's not about risk. It is to ensure that people are holding on to their mutual fund units for a longer span. People should not repeatedly buy and sell because it can create more volatility. Ultimately, what we want people is people should hold on to their mutual fund units for a longer time. So to encourage people to hold on to their mutual fund units for longer time, we have seen that long term capital gains tax is lower than the short term capital gains tax. Are we clear with this? Now, our focus is on this long term capital gains tax on debt mutual funds. So here you can see on debt mutual funds, short term capital gains tax is applicable when you buy and sell a mutual fund unit within three years. Pe kitna hai? Within one year. So for example, in Feb 2023, I bought a mutual fund unit at rupees 100 and two years later, I am selling this at 150. Here, if I am selling it after two years, what will it become? Long term. But here it is still considered as short term because it is applicable for a period less than three years. So here, I made a profit of rupees 50. How much a profit I have made? That profit will have to add it up to my annual income. And depending upon the income tax slab I belong to, I am required to pay the income tax. So let's say my annual income is 10 lakh. To that, I'll add my profit and pay tax accordingly. Is this clear? Okay. What about long term capital gains tax? Now, this is what is interesting. Let's say in Feb 2023, I bought a mutual fund unit at rupees 100. In Feb 2027, I'm selling it at 150. Look at the time gap. Time gap is how much? Four years. Long term capital gains tax will come into play if I sell a unit after three years. Right? Now, when I'm selling a debt mutual fund after three years, I can claim a benefit which is called as indexation benefit. What is this indexation benefit? Let me tell you. Indexation benefit means whatever is my initial cost of acquisition. Initial cost of acquisition is rupees 100. This initial cost of making investment, this initial cost, I can make adjustment for inflation. Which means from Feb 2023 to Feb 2027, in four years, rate of inflation could have increased by 20%. If it has increased by 20%, this initial investment which I have made 100 rupees, what is its worth now? Abhi iska value kitna hai? I made 100 rupees investment 4 years back, but what is its worth now? Its worth is now 120 rupees, not 100 rupees. Because the initial adjust investment will be adjusted for inflation. So now I have to calculate profit. What will be my profit? 150 minus 100 nahi hota. 150 minus 120. So my profit in this case will be rupees 30. So I have to pay capital gains tax on rupees 30. So capital gains tax was 20% of rupees 30, that is rupees 6. Did you get the benefit of, did you understand the concept of indexation benefit? Indexation benefit is very simple. Whatever is the initial value of my investment, that initial value of my investment, I will adjust it for the present rate of inflation. So in this case, my overall profit margin has got reduced and I will make, make profit of rupees uh, 30 and I'll pay tax of rupees 6. Here the long term capital gains tax is not added to my annual income. Yaha clear is apko? All of you have understood this? Okay. Now let's see what is a change now. What is a change? Concentrate on the right hand side. This was the regime that I discussed. Long term capital gains tax is applicable for 3 years and above, tax rate is 20% and indexation benefit is available. I gave an example, 100 rupees you buy a mutual fund unit, but this 100 rupees after 4 years will be worth 120 rupees. So, you will calculate your inflation adjusted profit will be rupees 30 and you will pay 6 rupees. This is the earlier regime. See what has changed now. This is important from the perspective of your prelims. It is still applicable for 3 years and above. That's the first thing. Now, indexation benefit, which was earlier applicable, is not applicable. That's the second thing. Third, whatever profit which I am earning, that profit I'll have to add it up to my annual income and pay tax according to the tax lab I belong to. 
शॉर्ट टर्म कैपिटल गेन्स टैक्स क्या है देर इज नो स्पेसिफिक टैक्स स्टेट विच इज मैं इन द शॉर्ट टर्म कैपिटल गेन्स टैक्स हम मच एवर प्रॉफिट आई एम अर्निंग ऑन शॉर्ट टर्म कैपिटल गेन्स दैट प्रॉफिट आई एडेड टू माई एनुअल इनकम एंड पेड टैक्स सेम थिंग वी आर मेड इट अपलिकेबल फॉर लॉन्ग टर्म ऑल्सो गेटिंग दिस सो अर्लियर ऑन शॉर्ट टर्म दे वॉज नो इंडेक्सेशन बेनिफिट बट वी हैड इंडेक्सेशन बेनिफिट ऑन लॉन्ग टर्म नाउ वील हैव नो इंडेक्सेशन बेनिफिट ऑन लॉन्ग टर्म एंड शॉर्ट टर्म सेकेंड थिंग अर्लियर आई टू पे ट्वेंटी परसेंट कैपिटल गेन्स टैक्स नाउ वॉट एवर प्रॉफिट आई एम अर्निंग दैट प्रॉफिट आई एडेड टू माइनुअल इनकम एंड पे टैक्स दे इज नो बेनिफिट एट ऑल इन फैक्ट दिस इज कंसिडर्ड टू बी बैड फॉर द म्यूचुअल फंड इंडस्ट्री because people were investing in debt mutual funds because they can claim indexation benefit but that indexation benefit they will not be able to claim now clear now for example i have 100 rupees i am investing in a fd fixed deposit i am invested this in the year 22 and i am taking out money after Four years, twenty twenty six. So I have invested hundred, and after four years, I am getting one fifty rupees. So here, on my FD, what is my profit? Profit in this case will be equal to fifty rupees. So I will have to pay the capital gains tax here, the interest income I have to pay. But same hundred rupees. Earlier, I used to invest in debt. Mutual funds. Year is twenty twenty two. I have invested hundred. In twenty twenty six, I am getting one fifty. But I used to get indexation benefit. Indexation benefit means the initial investment was considered to be one twenty, and the profit was considered to be rupees thirty. So capital gains tax of Twenty percent of rupees thirty. I have to pay it as rupees six earlier. But now I am investing in a debt mutual fund. Year is twenty twenty two. I have invested hundred twenty twenty six. I am make uh, getting a profit of one. I am getting return of one fifty. So now profit is equal to rupees fifty. This profit I will have to add it up to my annual income. and on that annual income i have to pay the tax so can i make a statement here that earlier for me it was more attractive to make investment in debt mutual funds rather than fd but now fd and debt mutual funds are both same in terms of tax samay aaya sabhi ko ab abhi aapko now how it has changed okay Okay. Next one is presumptive taxation. What is presumptive taxation? So let's understand presumptive taxation. In India, we have large number of taxpayers, small taxpayers. So when I say small taxpayers, it could include the micro enterprises, that is small scale industries, or it could include self. employed professionals when i say self employed professionals uh, we are talking about self employed professionals such as doctors uh, chartered accountants lawyers all of these are self employed professionals now let's say these enterprises and self employed people they are required to pay tax now what they have to do is they have to pay tax on their net income when i say net income it means how much ever income they have earned from that income they need to deduct their expenses and then calculate their net income and on that net income they are required to pay the tax for example let me give an uh, example of a doctor let's say there is a doctor this doctor is running his own clinic while running his own clinic let's say this doctor is earning say around rupees 20 lakhs 
in a year but uh, the doctor who is running his clinic also has to incur certain expenditure for running his clinic for example he has to pay the rent for the clinic he has to pay the salaries of his officials right now let's say he is incurring a expense of rupees 5 lakh so his net income in this case will be equal to 15 lakh on this 15 lakh he had to pay income tax according to the tax lab he belongs to is this clear now the problem here is with respect to these expenses expenses which the self employed professionals and micro enterprises are required to incur in running their businesses to uh, account for those expenses right on a an annual basis they need to maintain books they need to maintain accounts and these books or accounts should be regularly audited and then they have to pay tax the problem which will happen in this case is it is very very difficult for small enterprises or for say doctors or lawyers and so on to maintain detailed accounts of their expenses and getting their accounts audited so what we have done to reduce their compliance burden what we have done is we have introduced a concept called as presumptive taxation look at the word presumptive presumptive means we presume that your income is so and so we are presuming how are we presuming we are just saying whatever is your receipts a certain percentage of your receipts is your income and on that income you pay tax you need not maintain any kind of accounts don't maintain accounts whatever receipts you are getting certain percentage of your receipts will presume it to be a tax income and on that you pay the tax for example for self employed professionals like in this case the example of doctor which i said his income is 20 lakh here we'll say we will give you we will consider that 50% of your receipts is your taxable income we are presuming this and remaining 50% you might have spent on maintenance that is what we is consider as presumed to taxation so this was introduced way back but what we have done is we have just changed certain things with respect to presumed to taxation let's see what has been changed so you can see with respect to presumed to taxation rational small tax payers or the self employed professionals or micro enterprises need to maintain detailed accounts to calculate the tax liability hence it increases their tax burden so compliance objective is to provide relief to tax payers from tedious job of maintenance of accounts and getting the account audited working mechanism whatever is their turnover a certain percentage of turnover they have to require to pay as a tax how let's see for certain specified self employed professionals gross turnover is less than 50 lakhs in that case 50% of their gross turnover they have to require to pay as the they have to consider that as their income and on that income they have to pay the income tax like i gave an example for doctor the annual uh, turnover for doctor was 20 lakhs so here we'll consider his taxable income is 50% of that that is 10 lakh on that 10 lakh he'll pay the tax for small businesses if the turnover is less than 2 crores 8% of the turnover they have to pay as tax got it now what we have done is we have simply increase this turnover limit for small businesses and specified professionals for small businesses the threshold limit has been increased from 2 crores to 3 crores and for self employed uh, professionals this threshold limit has been increased from 50 lakhs to 75 lakhs that's a new development which has taken place are we clear okay now coming to the last part last part is with respect to tax proposals related to agnivir corpus fund what is this agnivir corpus fund let's understand i hope all of you know about agnipat scheme introduced by the government under the agnipat scheme the government is recruiting youths into defense forces that is army navy and air force for a period of 4 years so they will serve in the defense forces for 4 years and after that 75% of agnivirs they will be uh, uh, they will no longer be part of defense forces they have to find employment outside 
but remaining 25 percent of agnivirs they will be recruited back into defense forces now for the benefit of agnivirs the government has started a fund called as agnivir corpus fund now question is paisa kahan se aayega in this fund so you can see agnivirs will contribute 30 percent of their monthly income let's say person's monthly income is 10,000. So, he will contribute 3,000 to the Agnivir Corpus Fund. Same amount will be contributed by the government. So, government will also contribute rupees 3,000. So, let's say I am Agnivir. I am contributing 3,000. Government is also contributing 3,000 on my behalf. So, for one Agnivir, how much money will be contributed every month? 6,000. Okay. So, now this Agnivir Corpus Fund Right now, it is maintained under public account of India. It is a non-lapsable fund and it is administered by Ministry of Defense. Please do understand, remember this, it is not Ministry of Finance, it is Ministry of Defense. Now, what happens is, once Agnivir completes four years of his engagement with the defense forces, after four years of engagement, Agnivir will be paid with Seva package. Seva package, kahan se aega paisa iska? from this Agnivir Corpus Fund. So, how much of money we have contributed for 4 years, all that corpus will be paid back to Agnivir along with interest for, for these 4 years. So, here Seva package includes Agnivir's contribution, government's contribution as well as interest for 4 years. Now, what is the budget proposal? Budget proposal says, contribution made by Agnivir so, Agnivir Corpus Fund is exempted from tax. So, here I have made 3000 rupees monthly contribution to Agnivir. So, this I can claim it as my tax exemption, tax benefit. So, I will pay income tax only on my remaining money. Remaining money is rupees 7000. Second, payment received by Agnivir after 4 years is also exempted from tax. So, after 4 years I will get some tax. Uh, the, the Seva package. Even on that Seva package, I am not required to pay the tax. That is a budget proposal. Are you getting this? So, it is basically a kind of social security fund which we have set up for Agnivirs. So, there was a lot of criticism against Agnivir scheme. I hope you must be knowing about it, right? So, now we are at least ensuring that the Agnivirs will be provided with kind of social security. That is the basic idea about it. Are we clear with this? Okay. So, I have completed two big uh, chapters of the economic survey in this particular week. So, we will stop the class here. In next uh, week's class, I will uh, start with the other chapters. Okay. And as far as the questions that I have taken up in today's class, those questions we will be uploading it as practice question on the eLearn portal. So, please go and attempt the practice questions on the eLearn portal. Okay. Uh, and apart from that, uh, Last year's budget and economic survey, those of you who have not seen it, please do watch it because it is as important as this year's budget and economic survey. And if you want to uh, understand this year's budget and economic survey, a sound understanding of last year's budget and economic survey is equally important. Because only then you will be able to understand the overall linkages. Right? Fine? Okay. So, once again, uh, we are extremely sorry for the delay in conducting the economic survey analysis okay, because of certain unavoidable circumstances, need not worry. So, next we will continue with the session and try to cover the remaining chapters as well. Okay, Thank you so much. So, in case if you have doubts, you can just ask, start asking doubts one by one. Yeah, Shrikant. Are you able to unmute yourself? No? Just one second. Yes, she can. I'll I'll cover it, don't worry. I'll cover it in the economic survey class. So in the external sector, I'll cover I'll include that part. Do not worry about it. Uh Aishwarya? One second. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm not able to hear you, Ashwarya.
ओके आई कम बैक टू यू आई शोर जस्ट चेक यूर फ्रॉम यूर एंड Amrit, you are asking as to uh, dollar index value. Like I was saying, if dollar index value increases, it means value of dollar vis-a-vis the six currencies has increased. Same way, just like how we say that rate of inflation has increased, prices of goods has increased. Similarly, dollar index value increases means value of dollar vis-a-vis six currencies has increased. Clear, Amrit? Yeah, Palash. या पलाश तेन मी थैंक यू फॉर द सेशन सर या पलाश व्हाट वी डिस्कस्ड या 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 सलिप्ता इज आस्किंग मी टू एक्सप्लेन कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ एम जीरो एम वन एम टू एम थ्री डू नॉट वरी द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ एम जीरो एम वन एम टू is what i will be discussing in the next class next uh, survey class will be discussing the concept of m0 m1 m2 okay do not worry about this yeah abilash yeah abilash good afternoon sir good afternoon abilash sir actually yeah अगेन it's 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 not it's not about that uh, ki in what currency the trade is happening here what we do is uh, to say this you know the concept of near right nominal effect to exchange rate yes abilash just one second abilash yeah do you know about this near concept yes, okay okay here in case of near what we do is the value of rupee we are comparing it with a basket of 40 currencies okay so when i compare the value of rupee with a basket of 40 currencies and if i say that near value is increasing what do you think the value has happened to value of rupee vis a vis these 40 currencies yes abilash i i would say that if near increases there is appreciation in the value of rupee vis a vis this 40 currencies same way if i am saying that the dollar index has increased it means the value of dollar has increased vis a vis those six currencies so dollar index that we are talking about in uh, in, con- in context of india it is same as near okay so uh, when i'm take up when i'm going to take up the chapter of exchange sector don't worry i will briefly touch upon this topic of near and rear so that time i'll come back and link that concept to dollar index okay I think it is applicable only to the seventy-five percent of Agni Vids who are coming out because the remaining twenty-five percent of Agni Vids they will continue to remain as part of the defense forces and they might get a package after fifteen years. Yeah. Sure, sure, Abilash. Indrani. Yeah. 
या इंद्रणी गॉन uh yeah to a certain extent you have certain companies which are set up solely for money laundering so here also we have certain startup companies which are set up only for money laundering as soon as money laundering takes place they close on the business yes you have rightly identified this okay sure 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 indani uh ritu bharan one second let me unmute you yeah ritu bharan You are not audible, Ritu Bharan. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Go on. Yes, Ritu Bharan. Yeah, yeah, please. Are you not able to speak up, Mr. Bharan? Okay. I guess you need to check your microphone. Check your mic. You're not able to ask it out. Okay, Ritu Bharan. I guess you have a number. Okay, I'll come back to you. Ritu Bharan, just hold on. Likit. Yes, sir. Yeah, Likit. Yeah, you're audible. Go on. We already discussed this in the uh, question, right? In the yeah, session. Uh, Don't worry. I will be uploading this in the form of a quiz on the Elan portal. So what I would uh, want each one of you to do is go and attempt that particular quiz on the Elan portal. So probably to today evening or tomorrow morning it will be made live, so you can attempt it. So there you have the right questions also. Uh, I mean the correct answers are given to those questions. Okay? Yeah, sure. Uh huh. Angel huh. can buy the he can see I told you one scenario where a person is buying it at a price above the fair market value. This is one case. In other cases, what we have found it as two rated companies are coming together and uh, between two rated companies the transaction is taking place above the market value for the purpose of money laundering for example let's say i have a company and uh, i will ask uh, some of my family members to start another company these two companies are rated now my company has surplus amount of black money so i want to launder it so what i will do is i'll ask the other company to buy my shares at a higher price so that is how it takes place not necessary the scenario which i discuss It is a very simplistic way of explaining it. It normally takes place between two companies which are related to each other. Okay, fine. Uh, next, Wanchuk. Yeah, Wanchuk. Go on. Just wanted to ask, what point can we like safely stop coming up with the newspapers? Come again. What point can we like safely stop reading the newspaper? Okay, when do you stop reading the newspaper? I like uh, I would say yeah. Uh, uh, by April you must start stop it. Uh, if you have read the uh, uh, paper until end of March, it should be sufficient. Yeah, I can now I can just ignore this. Not a problem, but just focus upon what has been in news until March at least. Yeah, sure. Welcome. Yeah, Harsh. Sir, my question was regarding this tax filing. Okay. Uh, 
GBVA plus yeah 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 it it can it can like if i if i increase my indirect taxes automatically what will happen to my nominal gdp it will be higher right yeah if the gdp growth rate is very high and gva is less so we need to check into the comparison between these two in the last 10 to 15 years only then we can have a clarity on that no okay. yeah Yeah. Okay. Uh, there, uh, as such, the intermediate commissions and all those things. So you mean to say, GDP is equal to GVA at basic price plus the product net indirect taxes, and where are those being accounted? Is that a question? Yeah. So, so that that is not accounted in that case. that doesn't get accounted directly so then that part is forfeited in the yeah yeah because like how we calculate is in india we took in we take into account uh, the gva at basic price for different different sectors so for different different sectors like agriculture uh, manufacturing and services we will calculate the contribution in terms of gva at basic price and to arrive at gdp at market price what we will do is we will sum up the gvi at basic price of these three sectors to that we'll add the net indirect taxes and how we we arrive at it, the gdp at market price okay sorry. okay yeah sure deepak yes deepak you are raise your hand okay aishwarya uh i guess sir am i audible yeah you are audible now tell me sir in case of a presumptive taxation uh, if it is like 50% of the amount uh, if it is amount is for example 10 lakh so uh, that should be paid for the uh, 10 lakh yeah yeah it's like if like the example i gave you doctors annual income uh, like the turnover was 20 lakh so 50% of the turnover is 10 lakh so the 10 lakh will be considered as his income so based upon that he has to pay the tax there is no fixed amount of tax it is like a normal tax yeah so it's it's like when i say presumed to taxation the tax rate will be as per the income tax lap but what is my taxable income the taxable income changes like for self profession uh, employed professional will say the taxable income is 50% of your turnover for uh, uh, self employed uh, for uh, small scale enterprises we say 8% of their turnover is the taxable income okay sure uh abhishek pratik yeah abhishek Mm -hmm. question with respect to the question number 8 which we discussed okay that right means there is a space where two people are supplied and therefore that is not a relevant problem to take into consideration okay let me check that question let's hold on because uh, the counter cyclic fiscal, fiscal policy okay okay tell me in the 
I can understand what you're trying to say. Yeah, I can understand. This is yeah. This is what I explain in the QIP class also. So here, uh, whenever I say tax, by default the tax is direct tax, by default, unless otherwise explicitly mentioned as indirect tax. Default is always tax. So if you look at the previous year questions of the UPSC also, by default tax is direct tax. Yeah. One question. Huh. Um, another question was with respect to the fact that government does not borrow externally using external commercial borrowing. Yes. Right? Yeah. So why do we include it as a fiscal deficit of the government if it is not a government borrowing? See, government, I'll tell you, when I say external commercial borrowing, external commercial borrowing, as the name suggests, it's a borrowing by the corporate entities. Corporate entities could be private sector or the public sector companies owned by the government. That is what is included in external commercial borrowing. So when I say external borrowings or the government, the government might have borrowed money from say World Bank or say IMF or say from Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. It's a government borrowing, but we don't call it as external commercial borrowing, right? Huh. So that is why it is included in the fiscal deficit. Okay. So this part of fiscal deficit is actually um, the no, 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 no. It's a, it's a sorin debt. Sorin debt means a government debt. Okay, Abhishek. Yeah, Sogandika. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Sogandika. Thank you so much for the session, sir. It's the first time I'm actually attending, so I'm very thankful to you. But Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. No, no, you can, you can, you can, yes. yes when will the economic, compass be economic compass, we are in the process of compiling the economic compass and uh, we are hopeful of releasing it in next uh, one, one week to 10 days. Thank you, sir. And okay. also regarding today's class, PPT, PPT will... yes, it's for the benefit of all the students, not just for Sogandika. The PPT will be uploaded on the Telegram channel, you need not worry about it. As soon as we are done with the class, the PPT will be uploaded. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure, sure. All the best. Thank you, sir. Sure. Anusha. This is regarding PPDC. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so does it have uh, intrinsic value? Uh, CBDC by itself does not have any intrinsic value. It's just like, uh, yeah, it's just like a currency note. Like if I, if you have a 500 rupee note in your hand, so that 500 rupee note by itself, it does not has any intrinsic value, right? Same with go, goes with CBDC. By itself, it does not has an intrinsic value, but only thing is that uh, its value will be same as the value of a physical note. Yeah, sure. No, no, you cannot say that it has intrinsic value. You can't. Okay. Thank you. Sure, sure, Anusha. Yeah, Ritu Baran, I, uh, did you check your mic? Yeah, you're audible now, Ritu Baran. Tell me. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah. Off budget borrowing, I'll tell you, off budget borrowing here, what happens is PSU is borrowing money, but only when the government is guaranteeing repayment of those borrowings, then it becomes part of debt. Otherwise, it does not become directly part of debt, right? Yes. Only when the government gives guarantee, then, then it becomes a part of liability. Yes. Uh -huh. SDR, uh -huh. SDR special drawing rights. 
I don't think it's part of the debt. It's not part of the debt. It's part of our forex currency asset. Yes. And GST compensation says, yeah. Sorry, come again. No, 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 because here we are talking about the union budget. So since you are talking about the union budget, it will always include only those taxes collected by the central government, not by the state government. So when the state government will present its budget, there the state government budget, it will include the SGST, the state GST. It will include the state taxes like professional tax or say the tax that it earns from stamp duty, so tax from alcohol. So that is included in the state government tax, state government budget. Okay, sure, sure. Yes, Tarun? Hello, sir. Yeah, Tarun? Yeah, you are audible. Tell me. No, no, here I have asked the other way. The other way which I have asked is what is the impact of increase in dollar index on the Indian economy? Uh -huh. hmm. Uh, did you go through the previous year's uh, economic survey, Tarun? No, I didn't. Yeah, yeah, you should go through the previous year's economic survey. But since you have asked this question, let me tell you. Now, let's say when there is increase in policy rates in US, right? So if US Fed Bank is pursuing a Fed tapering, what happens is the FPIs who are made investment in India, they are going to get a higher returns in USA, higher rate of interest in USA. So they will sell off the do, uh, government securities in India and they will m make more investment in US. So in India as FPIs are selling more government securities, supply of government securities will increase. As the supply increases, the bond prices will decrease and bond price and bond yield, they are inversely proportional. Bond yields will increase. Okay. So please go through the previous year's uh, economic survey, you will get a clarity on that, need not worry about it. And even if you don't understand after going through previous year's economic survey, you can very well ask me question in the next class when we meet for the next Sunday, right? Sure, welcome. Fine then, uh, thank you so much. I will uh, meet you next week, next Sunday, okay? Thank you.